What's really good, everybody? This is Nathan Allbach, and welcome to the podcast where we get into people's stories and go down a bunch of rabbit holes about what's really good in the world. So, as uh, most of you know, a lot of the episodes I've been doing and scheduling recently are around internet culture. I've got ones in the pipeline right now with Viking and Gracie Hughes from Twitter. Hopefully coming out next week if uh, everything stays on track, which I'm really stoked about. But I also wanted to break up the rhythm a little bit with having some people from the local music scene on. So, that's what you're getting today. For this episode, I got to chat with a really great friend of mine from over the years, Kyle. Shiva. Kyle and I started to get to know each other back in 2011-ish when I booked his band Former Bell for local shows, which started this wild ride where I ended up joining the band, then leaving to do solo stuff like a year later, then uh, starting a band with my ex-girlfriend, Rachel, which uh, he wound up recording for and then joining. So uh, yeah, we've just been mutually involved in a ton of fun stuff over the years. Uh, I don't think I've said this on the podcast before, but the intro song that you're hearing under my voice right now is called Alone With You, which is off the solo record I put out with my most recent band that he was also the drummer for. So every time you listen to the podcast, you're also listening to him drumming and you didn't even know it. So (laughs) super, super cool to uh, get to talk to him finally. Um, We've been really good friends over the years and Kyle's just a great guy. I mean, this was the first time we've hung out in a long time. So we started off just reminiscing over our musical experiences together to set the tone. Uh, We also both recently got married. So we talked a bit about our relationships. And we also touched on this whole fire Festival fiasco, which, as I'm sure most people listening to this know, is just insane. So uh, from there, we got into just social media culture in general and a bit on podcast culture in general, too. So a lot of good stuff. Um, It's all always the best having friends in studio to record these things. It's just a great excuse to hang out and catch up without just the distractions of your phone and your environment and all the outside noise that can get in the way of talking to people, you know? Like, it's just, you get locked into conversation in the moment, which none of us get to do enough of these days. So, yeah, I love doing this episode, and I hope you all enjoy it as well. Now let's get into what's really good. Kyle Shiva, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Cool, I actually cool spot. <laughs> thanks, dude. I actually thought right before I hit record, uh, since we're just hanging out in person, which not a lot of the guests I get to do this with. Right. I wanted to just be like, "What's up, dude?" But then I thought you've listened to the podcast before, and I start every I episode. I'm like, "Thanks for coming on the podcast." I don't want to throw you off. Or, right. I'd have been disappointed. Yeah, you're a man of routine, so you know that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, thank yeah. you. We were um, we were just talking before we got on about the intro song to all this, right. which is which which you probably just heard. Yeah, our tune. Yeah, the first time I I heard the podcast, I would just like my I think my like snare drum hit is like the first thing you hear. Right. I'm like no, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. yeah, <laughs> I'm like no way. For people who don't know. Kyle, uh, Kyle drummed with me in a band of sorts for, it was a long, it was like three years, wasn't it? In a couple of iterations too. Yeah. 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 Right. It was a fun time. We, my ex-girlfriend Rachel and I did a, the duet type project of songwriting folk type material. And, yep. um, that went on for a little bit and then Kyle started drumming with us along with some other friends. And once that project ended, it became like a solo venture on my part to which Kyle stayed aboard. I was just like, let's, of course. Let's well, keep I had it to like going. beg my way into the band because, uh, and this is something Please that stop. I that I did want to talk about too, <laughs> just like musical relationships. But um, you had me uh, record the drums, um, mm-hmm. and I actually ran into uh, the the guys uh, Mike, who, whose house we did that at on New Year's Eve. But um, 
uh, and had to do like a triple take. He walked past me once and I said hi, like thinking it was just somebody I recognized. The yeah. second time I saw him, I'm like, oh my gosh, I spent so much time. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah, okay, take take that again kind of thing with him. But yep. um, yeah, like, so I recorded that with you and then you were playing shows and I was I was still playing in former Bell, which you had played in previously as well. There's so much which to is, talk which, about, right? Which is how we met, really. <laughs> yes, yes, um, yeah. or, I mean, We met before you actually joined the band, of course. But um, it, it was funny that like you were like hesitant to ask me to play, and then at the same time, I'm like, oh man, I would love to go and perform <laughs> these songs live. How do I like tell him to like let me do that? Yeah. Um, but hey, you know. It, it, it worked out. Yep. It was such a weird time, too, I remember, because we had another drummer who was friends with our bass player that I was playing with at the time. Right. They had played in a band together before. Right. Yeah. And it just started not working out with him. I mean, like, him and I were cool. We, we had talked about it a bunch. But you and I, we always clicked, and we played in that band, Former Bell, before. And I always, and I, I know I told you this before, all that, where I was always like, you're, like, my favorite local drummer. And I was sure. very vocal about that because it's one of those things where especially in the suburbs you know we're like right outside philly i mean even in philly like really anywhere you go drum a good solid drummer is probably the hardest thing i think to come by because it feels like everybody plays guitar sure everybody plays bass everybody yep. wants to sing but drumming's like a lifelong like you either have it or you don't right you know and i and i guess like coming out of like high school or college i always thought like the opposite it was like everybody i know plays drums <laughs> And so, so when people would say stuff like that, like, oh, it's so hard to find a good drummer. And, you know, I'd, I've been doing it a long time and I, I understand that I'm a, a decent player, but I would never be like, oh, yeah, like, of course, I'm the guy. Yeah, like, in your you mind, know, you're like, oh, I'm a dime a dozen. Like, I know a bunch basically, of drummers. Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, meanwhile, that's like from a songwriter standpoint, especially, it's like the hardest thing to find right. someone. So, I mean, yeah, how did you, let, let's, 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 that's a good place to start. Like, how did you, going back to our old band, Former Bell, how did you get all into that? Want to lay some groundwork? Yeah, kind of. It's funny because uh, I was basically in the same position in that band. Like, I went to see them play, and I had played with, so yeah, I'd played with Bruno. Uh, Bruno Catrombone uh, was the, you know, the, the force behind it all. Mm -hmm. And and similar to when I was in the band with you, like, I couldn't have been more grateful for that because I just wanted to play, and it got to a point, like, I didn't want to be, like, butting heads, like, oh, I want, I want the song to go this way. Like, right. he came all the songs like here's how it's gonna go and, and and that to me like that that's more my style as far as like being in a in a band or in a group like that right like i, I like somebody that is a leader yeah. yeah and i remember in the beginning because i was booking shows at that time it was like 2010 11 it was like 2011 10 I think. probably it was 11 when i joined the band right okay yeah. so i mean i was booking shows because i booked former bell's first show and that was when tim boschick was still the drummer Boss Correct. Twix, that's how you say Boss his name, Twix, yeah, right? Yeah. And yep. um, you came on as like a secondary percussion keyboard yeah, type and, player. Yeah, and actually they um, had a gig that Tim could not do. And um, I, I don't remember if Tim or Bruno was the one who actually asked me like, hey, can you do this gig? We're, we want to do this show in New York, yeah. but Tim can't make it. So uh, they wanted me to fill in, but I think it was Tim's idea that like, if he's going to come and, like, learn all the songs, like, why don't we have him play, like, auxiliary stuff as well? Like, anything we can't cover right. that, you know, the violinist or the bassist or what, you know, Bruno or Tim couldn't cover. So they asked me to uh, play play keyboards and auxiliary percussion um, basically after that one fill-in right. date. And then I had, like, one other gig that Tim couldn't make, like, a couple months later, and I played drums. So, like, I knew all this stuff, um, but I, d I definitely spent some time, like, figuring out what the heck to do on a keyboard. I mean, I literally, <laughs> like, it's really laughable to me that I traveled to Brooklyn before as a keyboardist in a band and brought this, like... It's probably a Casio yeah, yeah. keyboard with, you know, built-in <laughs> speakers. Um, and I was in a band doing that one time. It's really right. like, it was, but without that, like, I would have not probably ended up playing with you, you know, f four or five years later or something. So, yeah, I was, I went to see Former Bell and, and Bruno was somebody who I actually played my first show with in high school in Westchester. So, um Going to see him uh, play, he actually performed one song, maybe two, that we had played just fooling around together in college. Wow. So I was like, I got to see it performed, and I was like, wow, like, it's a 
full band. Like, this is amazing. Right, like, this right. sounds so good. Like, yeah. performed well, the whole deal. So, like, right away, I'm like, I'm so into this. Like, I, I want to go home and, like, find it on MySpace or whatever the uh, the medium was at that time. Maybe even been, like, pure volume. Oh, my God. Pure volume. Which I just yes. Googled. Or, that was the best back in the day. It just pure. went away, like, I want to say a year ago or really? so. Really? Yeah. It's, like, it's all off the servers, you it, mean? Like, it's not yep. even there anymore? Disappointingly, wow. yeah. So, End of an era. Right. So we're kind of jumping all over. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I got to see them play. And then was, like, a fan of the band. And then it was like, hey, can you fill in and play drums? Absolutely. You know, I'd love to do it. And then it may have been a year or so, and and Tim decided to leave the band. And I was on my way to a Saves a Day show in Allentown, and Tim either texted or called, and then five minutes later I hear from Bruno as well, like, hey, Tim was just giving me a heads up, mm-hmm. like, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. And, you know, you're probably going to get the call on, like, hey, Will you like will you play drums full time? Because it was uh, kind of nice where like if I couldn't do a date because like I had to, uh, I was going down the shore with my family like something dumb that was like right, kind of yeah. non-committal but I'd sort of rather be doing. At that time, I sort of felt like I had the option to be like, well, I can't do that gig. Exactly. And it's like, well, all right, we want to have that extra snare drum part, like no big yeah, deal. Yeah, but now you're committed. Exactly. So so Tim was kind of giving me that heads up, I guess, and and didn't really think much about it. It was like, of course, I'm going to come play and. Like, I'm a drummer. Like, this is what I right. you know, should be doing anyhow. So um, we played, like, I don't even know how many more, like, another year or so um, in that same iteration. And then um, I guess our violin player left and me, Bruno, and Pat, who actually just started a new band, um, were playing as a as a trio for a little bit. Yeah. And then... Pat was getting married and had a kid, and I believe we we may have had like one fill in player in between. It was probably not. It was probably after you joined because we had you come in to play bass. And right. when um, Bruno told me that Nate is going to be the bass player, I had somebody, another guy named Nate, like completely <laughs> different. And I, like so, it, until like the day you were probably coming to rehearse at my house, yep. was like. I thought somebody else was coming over. That's so <laughs> yeah. funny, dude. <laughs> and and I had met you through the shows in Harleysville because right. I had attended at least one and played it at least one since I had joined Former Bell. Yeah. Um, and uh, we we played for at least a year together, right? In yeah. Former Bell, as as just the uh, just, just it was a, a trio piece again. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think. Joe Montone came he in and played right keyboards, and I, right, so I couldn't remember if you were uh, a part of that or not. So I guess when um, when you stopped playing with us, I, I think Bruno came to me and and said like, "Hey, do you know anybody that wants to play?" Or he, I think he may even have suggested Tim Bostwick because mm-hmm. Tim is a drummer like by trade. He yeah. teaches at the high school or did, and was like really involved in drumline. Um, and but he also used to play bass in in the rowdies mm-hmm. and maybe another band here and there. So I'm like, well, wait a minute. Like Tim, as far as I know, is also a bass player, like yeah. more so than I know him as a drummer in a band, you know. And I was like, how cool would that be? Like because Tim invited me basically right. he into was the, the band. original drummer. <laughs> and it was like the coolest thing for me to be like, hey, can like Bruno, can I call Tim mm-hmm. and like see if he wants to like be in the band again like yeah. i don't know it's like such a such a, a weird thing but um it worked out and we started playing probably for a year before josh miller joined up with us and that was sort of similar too i don't think like to when you came over like i don't think uh tim like knew that somebody was coming over to like join us we you know rehearsed in my right. bedroom it's been right. the same way for up until two years ago it's been that way for like five years like yeah. that was like ground zero of like kyle's bands like that's where you rehearse. Like, I had so many different musicians in there. It's funny. It's so like, in crazy. different iterations of different bands and stuff. So, when Josh came over the first day, like, I don't even think Tim knew that there was somebody coming to, like, basically join our band. Like, right. It wasn't like an audition. It was just, hey, this guy learned some of the parts. He's going to play keyboards. Yeah. And, you know, fast forward two or three years, like, Josh became, like, like he did, like, background Main vocals and guitar of, parts yeah. and, and really, um, 
to what maybe I thought I was doing like five years ago playing keyboards and auxiliary percussion, but he really he brought it to the next level. Yeah, he really filled it all out and like made it a like you know that fourth member to uh, you know fill in all those parts. It was kind of cool. Yeah, those are some good times, man. It's crazy looking back at the, all the iterations of that band and how yeah it was all centered around your bedroom, that little <laughs> bedroom space. We had like the drums in the corner and we'd all like come together. Everybody kind of gathered around the bed the just bed. because I'm of the on setup. One side of the bed someone's on the other side of the bed <laughs> sure but i think it did well like for sound purposes oh my God, it was and everything great. too it made no sense to me it never made sense it's like how does it sound so good yeah. in this bedroom that's that's like the one thing i miss most about like living in an apartment now yeah and and the thing that i probably look most forward to like looking at homes in the next year or so it's like got to have a basement got to have a garage Practice and I'm, and i'm still not sure if the garage or the basement is like more of a priority. Yeah. Because like I've still been able to like mess with my bikes and my cars and whatever, but having the music spot back again. I mean, I still have every bit of my gear, just like in storage in this person's house or up in you know in, right. the, in my apartment or yeah. at, at the office and the shelf in the back. Like, right. So I'm, over. Yeah, I'm excited to like put that back together. And I I ran an, um I saw Bruno play uh, about a week or so ago. And told him and Tim, like, I, I can't wait till, like, I have a spot again. Mm-hmm. And, like, come on, come on over, guys. Like, yep. just pretend we have a rehearsal and, like, let's just <laughs> kick it for the afternoon, Take, you know? Yeah, jam it up. Yeah. It's so great. Like, when you look back at, I guess, college or even before college, when you kind of started to get involved with the local music scene and all that, mm-hmm. was there a point where you thought to yourself, this is something I want to do? Because for you, it's just to kind of trail back on that a little bit for you. I don't, we can get into this if you want. I'm not sure what you went to college for, but I mean, music since you graduated has become a pretty substantial part of your life. So, yeah, I was a business management major. Okay. Um, and that had always kind of been my attitude. Like, I had friends in high school, we had a, a band that we like, you know, worked a lot on and was just like the reason to hang out. Like, we recorded songs, we may have played like 10 shows in our whole. But it was for fun. Career, yeah, but it was it was just, like, the outlet. And, like, maybe one or two of the guys in that band in high school heading into college time was, like, this is, like, I have to do music for a living. Like, this is, mm. like, what else would I do? Yeah. And at the time, I like, 13 or 14, I was working at an ice rink, like, at the snack bar making money. <laughs> yeah, And, yeah. you know, it might have been $6 an hour, but, like, on Saturday when we're, like, oh, shoot, we need a new, like, PA speaker stand or like it was like well I have cash because like I can I can get that you're for working us. Yeah. yeah yeah so like early on like the just that little bit of money or a little bit of value in in having that uh, ability to like go out and grab something if you needed it when you were pretty you know, pretty young like just starting to drive or whatever yeah um I was always like you know what I, I know I'm just like I I'll work and then I'll come home and like have my my fun time which you know, like whatever it be, music, skateboarding at the time or right. cycling now or, you know, whatever. So what, so going post-college and you joined Former Bell and then it becomes this full, more full-time committed endeavor. Was there a point in that period when you were starting to drum full-time where you felt like, is this something I want to keep up at this level? Because obviously graduating high, gra- graduating college and having student loan debt and having to worry about this sort of adult world of, right. you know, growing up and having responsibilities <laughs> and all that. It's one of those things where we deal with this all the time as people who play music where in social situations when people are asking you what you do and right. all that, you start, you want to talk about music, but then you also kind of sound like a bum. Where right. You're just like, like, no one's going to take me seriously here. So like after college, was it like, what was it like for you kind of um, committing to that project? Like I, it was pretty, I feel very fortunate because it, it wasn't like that demanding. There was times in Former Bell when like, um, and actually I don't even know that I was really a part of this, but like just, I remember like one of the two of the guys saying that like, like they would rehearse on like a Tuesday night when they didn't even have a show like within the next like couple of weeks. And to be honest, you and I did that stuff when we joined up and I got to actually play live with you. Yeah. Um, and I was like so appreciative of that. Like, cause to me, like the more rehearsal, the better, like oh, come right. show day. If you can just not even worry about like, you, you don't want to know, think ex- about it. Yeah, yeah. Just, and that's like that type of preparation of, uh, of just knowing what you, what you got to do. That's kind of how I am in my, you know, my whole life. So, um, yeah. you know, not just in going to play music. Like if I know I got something to do on Friday, like it's Monday, I'm, 
you know, planning for it. Like, all right, what kind of am I going to need to have those clothes cleaned or, you know, whatever. Yeah, wedding you're coming a very up. organizational yeah, person. Yeah, so yeah. Um, the, the, music, uh, the music scene doesn't really, like, lend itself to that type of thing. And that was probably the only, like, real struggle with it. That and at the time I, I was working at, like, 530 in the morning on a golf course. So yep. um, any, like, late night stuff and by late night I mean like 9 30 you're cut off was, yeah, yeah, yeah was we like, gotta get done by 9 30 yeah. we're out of there yeah. and and it, we never really had issues with that with uh like practices or anything yeah. um but there was definitely like you know shows on a Thursday night or something that was you know difficult to do sometimes and sometimes if it was you know the right thing to do I just tell my boss like hey I'm I would like to come in at eight o'clock tomorrow is that okay and right you know keep my rest and just kind of stay in a rhythm. Healthy or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause it, it would definitely happen. Like I'd be out on a Thursday night and then I'd go hang out on the weekends and some weekends I would still be working at five in the morning. So, um, it, it definitely took a toll, but, um, like you said, I'm, I'm very organized. So it wasn't like, it wasn't that hard to kind of like balance that. Mm -hmm. But uh, to, to go back to your question, like I, I never really like sought out to be like, I, I gotta like always be playing in a band because mm -hmm. it wasn't until after college. And to me, at 20 years old, like I had this like discovery, like, whoa, like I could, I could kind of like keep doing this. Mm -hmm. And there were points where it was like too frequent, but then there was like a couple months that would go by where we'd play like every other Thursday or every other Friday or whatever. And like, it was like the sweet spot. Right. It's like, yeah. oh, I can like go gig like twice a month and like still have my regular life that, you yeah. know, that nothing that the band wouldn't, like, impact any of that kind of yeah. stuff. It was, so. like, right between uh, just kind of doing music for fun and not being very committal with it and then also doing it professionally. It's that sweet yeah. spot of, like, where we were doing, like, mini tours and exactly. playing pretty cool venues and opening up for cool people. And, you know, we have to promote it and get people to come out and, and rehearse all the time. But it wasn't to the degree or it was, like, you know, degrading our well-being. You right. know, like, we we're like, oh, man, we got to practice, like, while on top of, everything else it was that or like sweet oh spot. the label's demanding a new something by friday <laughs> yeah. yeah so exactly it was it was totally uh recreational i would say yeah um but to me like that was a luxury man like because and and you you had uh, sort of alluded to it earlier like was there any point where maybe i thought it was like too much and i've thought that plenty of times but i had to like keep reminding myself and here i'm 30 years old now but I kept saying, like, I could be, like, 45 and, like, still be doing this right. band. Like, I can't quit. Like, yeah. th these these are guys I'm friends with, and we, we play music together. Like, this is why it, it clicks. Right. And I would always, like, sort of use, like, the starting line as, like, a, an analogy. It's, like, they haven't toured or anything in five, ten years or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And once a year, they come around and they play a show. Now, we're definitely not the starting line, but <laughs> to me, I'm like, if we could do this once a year, like, right. if I have a family, you know. It's a way I to hang out, too. Exactly. Yeah, and yeah. that that's that's one of the biggest things that um, has been, like, my takeaway from getting to play with music or getting to play music with all sorts of different folks. And um, Bruno had said that really early on in Former Bell. Um, Tim may have even been in the band still as the drummer at this time but um i'll never forget he just said like whatever you know you guys do before or, or after this or during it or whatever like he's just like i hope everybody like has like their own like personal like positive takeaway that like everybody right. gains something from this right and i've like every next turn i'm like oh my gosh like i'm so glad like he mentioned that because now i'm thinking about it. it's like oh i now I've met this other guy and he's hooked me up with this person and now I'm like going and traveling with this guy and now exactly. he's having me record drums for him and now his cousin wants me to, you know, play a show. And I'm like, that stuff really, really stuck. Like, it's like, okay, good. Like, this is really worth every little, you know, thing you come across yeah. as, you, as you play. Yeah, the communal aspect of local music is honestly the the most rewarding in my mind, at least, just from over the years, when I think back, same to you, that was a great way of putting it, where you can designate in your mind, okay, when I started playing in this band, it led me to meeting this person, getting connected to this person, getting to do this. Like, I think back the same way to right when I graduated high school and started booking shows in that period. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. I was not... As, like, a, as a booker? As, or, as of anything. Yeah, I mean, okay. booker, <laughs> musician, person, I was clueless. Sure. But I mean, like, looking back in that period, it's interesting because my skill set, like, if I look back at the music I was writing then, it was terrible. And, like, as a promoter, I made tons of mistakes and all that. But it's having the 
the right people surround you is really everything in this field because from the beginning, and I made a lot of mistakes and I, I met a lot of awful people too. I remember there were bands I, <laughs> there were bands I booked that were either suggested to me or that I found on MySpace or Facebook or something. And they were really great bands and they'd get there. And I remember there was multiple cases where bands would be high on, not, not, pot like i'm talking shrooms like yeah, one yeah. time a band came so high on shrooms all of them that they couldn't get onto the stage they were putting their their equipment onto the stage to play tripping over themselves and their buddies were all in the corner at this table like literally head down on a table <laughs> like, like they just i don't know what they were like they planned it this way maybe they took too much i have no idea but um just you know situations like that where you uh, okay i won't book that band again right. or i won't you know stay associated with these people but and that's kind of easy to do but that's also like the downside of it like you can go and like hey you want to like play music next week like i just met you like the other day and then right. like you go play and it's like well maybe i don't want to do that exactly. ever again exactly and and, then... and it's like it's kind of easy to just say well i just won't pick up when that person calls or whatever right. but um it, it's like double sided, I yeah, guess, because like also, you said, some of those relationships end up being awesome, mm -hmm. and some of them, you know, it's like, well, these kids clearly showed up to be real serious about this. Yeah, like everybody's on a different playing field with it because yeah. it's kind of there's like the two ends of the spectrum where there's the one end of the people who just want to have fun and goof around, and maybe they're really talented, but they just they don't want to take it that seriously. And the other extreme end of that is like the super like driven. I want to make it. I want right. to be a musician for a living. I'm taking this seriously, and the close closer you get toward that end of the spectrum, I found that the types of relationships you develop are inevitably like very consumer-based, where sure. when you get to meet someone, you're thinking, how can I benefit from this person? Mm -hmm. You know, like you have these things, whether they're conscious or subconscious, it's like every person you meet is a connection. It's yeah. all a network. It's like, oh, this guy's a design guy. Yeah. Like, oh, maybe Wait, I Wait, who like... was that guy that we met? He said he did uh, marketing, right? Yeah. Like... <laughs> <laughs> what, find his Instagram thing. Like, yeah. we got to get back in touch with and him. And that's yeah. when it gets slimy because it's like, it's all part of the system. A little bit, yeah. yeah it's like, we all, we all know that's just the name of the game. And if you want to make it, you have to have connections. You have to, it's, it's a who you know industry like any other industry. You're right. But still, it's a weird position on the local level because it's, it is hard to kind of find who you mix and match with whether you're with what you're trying to do because right. you're, you're like in your position where you never sought out to be a professional musician but right. honestly you're like like teetering on that caliber like where you could be right. so when someone like bruno finds you like bruno i remember i mean i haven't talked with him or hung out with him in a little while now but during that time period i mean he was pretty serious like on that scale absolutely like he, he wanted to make it and all that so S still does and, and is going to like he's he played his, his spirit house um last two fridays ago or whatever mm -hmm. and and had the whole band he had uh, oh wow john john from cruiser played drums and um uh and josh has been playing with him so i've seen him and just him and josh play right. before but seeing him play with a drummer and a bassist paul uh who, who plays with cruiser also mm -hmm. played bass and I told him after the show, I'm like, dude, these are like, like, this is what it's about. Like for yeah. me, anyhow, as a, as a consumer, like the band, the presentation, like the full sound, the full view, really, right. you know, going to see it. And it's like, it's more than like two people. Yeah. Um, but really like. From like the recording to to the stage, like I told him, it just it really translates. That's still. awesome. I got to come out and catch one of the Spirit House shows. I mean, it's it's phenomenal music from what I've listened to it. But it he's is cool. like he's on that end of the spectrum where it's like absolutely he really has been since day one putting the effort in and the and the commitment in to really get to that point. So yeah, like on a local level, it, it does kind of get squirrely when you're trying to sort out where you belong and all of it and the kind of relationships you want to develop because, right. and then there's also the, the whole aspect of skill where it's like, that is the worst thing when you're trying to sort out, like, like you, you mentioned earlier how there was that sort of trial period where I sent you recordings and you played along to them so right. I could listen. And of course, right away, I was just blown away. I was like, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah you sent please. me like scratch tracks and I still have, I recently went through these files because I was updating my computer and opened up GarageBand and there's all these, it's actually just one file and then I would just like mute the tracks I wasn't recording. Yeah. So I just went through and like played all these songs that, and there's, there's, I have one of those files like for former Bell too that's just like, I would get the, it's the, just like an acoustic, the acoustic track with a vocal. Yeah. 
and 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 one of them for former bell i even like recorded bass to one day i'm like i want to hear this like right as yeah. like a full sound but like that stuff i think that's like my sweet spot mm-hmm. and not to say that i'm not creative because when i was in the band in high school like i was like the producer like it was like wait play that riff again like we're gonna use that but not here like wait till yeah this part and then actually don't play it the whole time just play it for half of it like that's that's where my mind goes like right you know here in you know, if I'm in that, like, that writing process, but, um... Well, that's, that's such a sweet spot, because, I mean, like, when we're recording or when we're playing, even just right. practicing, it's so key, like, as a songwriter, when I would bring songs to you and the band, where we have, like, a, a bass player and an electric guitar player and maybe another singer, and we're playing the parts out, and I hear it one way, but obviously I'm only one set of ears, so when you're putting the song in front of four other people, there's all these things, especially for someone who's an expert in, the, in a given instrument, where, like, I have no idea. I'm not... I, I might, like, have a surface level idea of, like, a drum part that might sure. sound cool, and, I, and I'll try to, like, explain it to you, or I'm like, in, Kah, in your thing. drum speak. Yeah, I'm like, doom ba doom Yeah. <laughs> but you can, like, put the whole thing together. Like, I, I remember there was, um... The one song when we were, we played with uh, the band with Rachel, it yeah. was Beggar, uh-huh. when we played that song, and you were asking percussion-wise, because that was like a uh, last-minute addition, I remember we were trying to think of like rim hits yep. and stuff with it, and like, yeah, like just, that's the kind of stuff I can, ideally I can think about it, but for, I need someone like, I need an expert to yeah. really unfold what that's going to sound like. And I can't do what you do in that aspect where you're like, like I like know what I need, but like I can't put my finger on it. Like yeah. I, I've never done like songwriting, so. Right. Uh, but but I can translate what you say, and and I, I can remember plenty of times when we were recording. Like you'd come into the room, like, and would like show me with your hands or your whole body, like <laughs> right. this is like what I want to hear here. And yeah. I'm like, oddly best. enough, I get exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And then, I don't know how much longer later or how much uh, later it was that you sent me like final recordings or you know for mastering or whatever mm-hmm. and i'm just like no way like he was so right like this came to life like because there was a few parts where i'm like i'll play that but i don't know i don't know yeah. right we always have you those said thoughts. you want it i'll do it you yeah know? that's what i'm here for so <laughs> and but some of those ended up being like my favorite i'm like i guess i just have to trust whatever you know i'll i'll play the hell out of the party right. telling me to play and well work yeah it works both ways it's such a it's such a cool when you get to playing a band like that, like that was really when I mean, we talked. You were, you said you were gonna bring this up. That email I didn't get back yeah. to you on, where you sent me that email, and I, th- I forgot I was probably just doing something and just got lost in my inbox or whatever. But uh, you sent that email about how it could be great to be able to play these songs again. And yeah, yeah. My mind always just does go back to that period where it's like it's so rare that you have a chemistry with other people in that sense where it's a give and a take and you, everybody feels comfortable offering. And even if there is like a tension, like I remember there was points where like my cousin Matt, who's my lead player for a couple years right. there, where him, him and I had some contentious moments because he's a very creative, amazing guitar player. He is. He's much more jam oriented, I think, than yep. me, where I'm more strict, like songwriter. I want format and play structure. It, and... Play it to like the record. Yeah. Kind of yeah, thing. yeah. Yep. So there was a bunch of times like we had some back and forth with him. But I mean, just generally speaking, when you have a good group of guys like that, it, I mean, it, it was, was a solid chemistry. And we, you know, had a, a couple of uh, of iterations of, of it, really. I mean, even back from playing with Rachel until, exactly. uh, until the last thing that we did together, like it, it was all probably one of the 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 best music experiences i've had and that's why like listening back and and it was probably the same time i like i just referenced i was clearing out my computer like backing everything up and found these files and and then i i was asking you like a month or two ago about like where how come your stuff's not on spotify and you're like (laughs) go go get it on uh on Bandcamp. um you know free download whatever do your thing yeah um but I, w- I went back and listened to it that night, I guess, when I was sending you that email. And, and uh, full disclosure, I think the first sentence is like, hey, uh, Ann's out tonight, and I'm at home drinking a Coors Light yeah, next, yeah. <laughs> next to my computer listening to your old song. So here goes, you know, and just uh, sort of described, like, what I was saying, like, about the starting line. It's like, hey, if we can do this, like, once this year, mm-hmm. I'm in. Right. And then whatever, we've got to rent a space or... You know, hire a guy to play keyboards or, you know, do this or do that or, right. you know, beg this friend or ask yeah. that guy to play at his club or something. I just like, I don't know. I, I'm i slowly like falling out of the, the music world. Same. And, and like, Ugh. It, it's it's sort of, uh, 
like I could definitely make it happen, I guess, if I wanted it more. Um, but the the thing I, that you came and saw me do with the DJ uh, with Chris in Doylestown. That was fun. And that, like, I forget. I think that was like a holiday. It was. It was St. Patty's Day. Yes. That yeah, was yeah. probably the biggest one. And then that we, was we played rager. again <laughs> in, in April and May. And then we didn't play again until August. And it was a Friday night in the summer. And it was just like, it just like crashed. And mm. like, we were totally due for a, a like a slow night there because mostly it was like a built-in crowd. Right. And we just, you know, we had like maybe like one or two return people. And that yeah. the goal was to like play every month to build up this thing where like if you're in the bathroom and you see the sign that says the human fund is going to be here next Friday, you're going to tell your friend like, hey, like right. remember that thing we did? Like you don't even have to remember the name. It's just like if you see that logo on the wall, like – Oh, they're going to be here next Friday. Let's yeah. come back then for that you're offering an thing experience. that we did. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, come yeah. focus on, like, these musicians or, like, this really cool guitar thing or whatever. But, yeah, that was that was kind of the idea behind it. And to my point before about, like, the sweet spot for gigs, we played there once in November of 17. Mm-hmm. And they're like, can you guys come back twice a month, like, all next year? Yeah. And John, um, who plays bass lives in Brooklyn and was like, well, how about like once a month? Mm -hmm. And then for me, it was like, Hey guys, let's put these dates on the calendar for like the next six months. And then just kind of yeah, sit sit back and relax because we've got the dates. We rehearse, you know, every so often. It wasn't like we were writing our own songs. It was just a, you know, a cover band with a live or or a DJ with a drummer and a bass player. Right. Um, so that was like the last or is the last thing I had like been a part of. And, uh, uh, former Bell played maybe one show in 2018, maybe two, um, or like earlier in the beginning of the year. Um, Is it officially broken up, or what's the deal? No, um, it's it's never been discussed that way. Um, it's it's happened like it's like come and, and gone in waves times before. Yeah. Um, and I I don't um, I don't see like new things being worked on. Um, but you know if. if if it if there comes a time like uh, I'm in same same as I said before like it's it's hard to like turn that stuff down like thinking yeah, you mean like it's once a year thinking like oh man I should have done that and here I am you know with with two kids and I'm at home and that guy is yeah. playing with the band that I could have been doing and it's just like that once a month or you know whatever however frequently but um, I would I would definitely like to do that um, but and same that's why I sent you that email like these songs are available and you know you you know you have enough of a of a a friend and fan base Mm -hmm. to like come out and support you know like one show i mean we're like talking about like marketing or whatever like book it like six months in advance and just you know once a month like kind of tickle everybody and say hey remember this thing i told you that we're gonna do and you know try and build it up and and see what you can kind of make out of it but the whole like idea behind that email was that like it was sort of like not not like an experiment but like hey let, if we could do these shows um you know we'll organize the heck out of it and you know it's january let's plan for a june and a whatever june and a september show and yeah. then we can figure out now where we're going to be able to rehearse or where we're booking the show and what kind of marketing we want to do and you know who's got what funds to do and where do we want to put our energy right um, you know, as opposed to like, hey, somebody offered me a gig next Friday. Can you do it? You know, exactly. And, and we're both uh, something else we'll probably end up talking about. But we're both recently married. Yes. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure looking on to like, you know, bigger things in the future where like these types of things with, you know, finding a you know, group of musicians that are, you know, available or willing or want to like perform in any capacity is is getting harder to do exactly. i guess so, we get yeah yeah so i'm definitely holding on to to any of those connections it is weird that we're both in the same sphere of life this like this weird sure. like quarter age type thing we're getting married moving yeah. in, like looking at houses soon yep. all that if we can <laughs> but it is it's and both working uh like professionally outside of the music world yes so and that and that's uh, what what has always worked for me, and that's why everything that's happened with whatever project I'm in, it's like, well, that was a lot of fun, right? You know, while while we were doing it, and like some of them I would really like to do again, but ultimately, 
hearkening back to what Bruno said years and years ago, like, look, look at all the stuff I got out of it. Yeah. I, I don't, I can't care that much if it's not going on. One, I didn't see hardly any of it out. Half of it just like fell into my lap. Exactly. I'm like, I, I'm super lucky to have been able to just contribute to all this and meet all these people and well, you're a lucky guy, a too, similar to me, I think, in this way a little bit. But I think you're even more so organized and structural than me, despite maybe a couple notches. Sure. And that's kind of the antithesis of musicians as a whole. Like, yep. the people that we know mutually in this in this Philadelphia music scene are very, you know, spontaneous and sporadic, and they don't have regular sleep schedules. They, right. they intentionally seek out part-time style jobs that will allow them flexibility Absolutely. with their schedules because they might be going on a trip to Brooklyn on a weeknight or whatever that might right. be, which is something that you and I haven't really um, fancied the past several years. You sure. know, we like our sleep. We like our stability. So we're kind of <coughs> we're kind of like the odd musicians out in a way. Absolutely. So, so it does feel a little strange now, especially like I remember – uh, this was in 2016. It was the last record that we put out together, Waste, and we we put that out in it was like July or something like that. And I remember, you know, having these conversations with you and the band. We talked about just like I was at a point in my life where I was ready to kind of put this behind, just for the time being, because where I was at, you know, I just um, I've been dating uh, my now wife at the time, mm-hmm. and I was thinking to myself, I'm, I'm going to marry this girl. I'm going to ask her to marry me yeah. in a couple months, probably, which I did. And my brain was kind of all over the place because, I mean, I'd been playing in bands and do, and heavily invested in the music scene for like seven years at that point. Right. So it got to the point for me where I had to kind of really look inward and reevaluate my own decisions kind of because growing up, I was one of those kids who, like Bruno, was like, I really would love to make a living doing music. And I kind of threw myself into the field and at some point I mean I don't know when I kind of started to have this self analysis but somewhere in the past few years before 2016 I sort of just kind of realized that I stacked up against certain musicians locally I started thinking to myself like ah, I'm like I'm I'm good like I'm okay like people enjoy my music and whatnot but I'm never yeah. going to be that good and I started to like compare myself in ways which uh, I would, if I was giving someone else advice, I would say never do that because right, you don't want right. to, you don't want to, you can always compare yourself and that doesn't... You're your own worst critic, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't really mean anything ultimately because you can, it doesn't matter if you're Taylor Swift, like you're always going to compare yourself to somebody. So, but anyway, it, it, I started to get more and more pragmatic about it and that started the slow demise of my, uh, I think my, um, whatever you want to call it, my entrepreneurial outlook on the whole project as as right. this like thing outside of work that was really eating my wallet. I mean, sure. you know, being a musician, it's like you got to pay for your amp to get fixed. You got to pay it just, just to drive to half the shows. Yeah, and, nothing's free. Yeah, and you're not really making money yeah. on gigs unless it's a special one. So <laughs> it's uh, there was that whole period of my life where I was going through those questions in my mind and I was thinking, I was looking at certain musicians I knew who were older and obviously it's not a knock on them, but like people who are several years older than me and they're still doing it. I started thinking like, I don't, when I'm 30, like, do I want to be in this situation? And I ended up reaching the point similarly to where you've kind of always been, where I realized, okay, I think I really need to prioritize my work and my schedule. And then once I do that, I can see if this is something that fits within that. You know what I mean? Like I need to start saving money and start being an adult and start taking more responsibility. And it just so happened that essentially in that period where I was just taking all that time off from music, it was only about a year after that when this whole Stakem Twitter thing blew up. So then once that blew up, that essentially became like my new project you're in yeah, yeah so i was absolutely. working like 80 hour weeks and nice. <laughs> like it became like okay i'm going to work 40 hours and i'm just doing whatever i'd be doing at the office and then after work i take this home with me and yeah. i'm sitting on my couch tweeting and works on with, your phone man yeah I'm, yep. I'm on the toilet i'm in the shower <laughs> i'm like wherever with my smartphone and uh, yeah drove chelsea insane for a while there she's we're good now but yeah so it's just it, it the way the timing worked out for me i really I realized I just needed to put that energy because it is energy. It's creative energy, Absolutely. It's commitment energy. Where even if even if you're not maybe putting you know 
10, 12 hours a week into it, it's still like your thought process, what I'm thinking about. Like I'm thinking about producing music. I'm thinking about, yep. do people care about my music? Do How can I get more shows? And that was a whole block I had to really just push myself through. And then you got people who are musicians who I'm friends with and I, I respect them obviously. And they're coming up to me and saying, ah, don't quit, man. Like, like keep at this. And yep. you know, I have to, you know, be that Debbie Downer who's like, Hey, I'm not quitting. I'm just, I can't do this the way you and I have done this for years right. where it's just at the helm of my life. So now that you and I are both married and, you know, we're, hopefully eventually looking to get houses and, and grow up and take on all this new responsibility. It's, it's definitely, that's all it is. It's not growing up. Yeah, exactly. It's just an added responsibility. Exactly. The yeah. older you get, you just got to take more responsibility on. And, and that's for me with the work I do it, for our advertising agency. It's like, if I want to, if I want to excel at the work I do and actually build some type of career off of it, I can't just go to work for 40 hours. Right. I literally can't. Like yep. if, I, if I'm just working 40 hours, like nothing, is going to come from it. And there's obviously some, like, I'm not sure we can talk about like what you're doing right now, but like there's, there's some career fields that offer themselves upward mobility at that 40 sure. hour a week mark, you know, but for what I do, it's like dog eat dog creativity with the best creative wins. So it's, it's definitely, definitely different for you. Um, but it's fun. I think we're in coordinating a day to, uh, record, um, you were like, oh, I'm taking a night class on Wednesdays. And I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm taking a night class on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> I was like, there goes our schedule. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, um, working after work and just continuing to uh, – continuing education. I mean, what are you going? it's, it's kind of – That was the what, first time we texted. Sorry to interrupt you. That was the first no, time cool. that we we'd even talked about that because you didn't know I was going to school and I didn't know no. you were going to school. So no, like, and to me – so, so to me, hearing that you're taking a night class, I'm assuming like – I have an idea of what you're doing, and you can tell me if it's, like, you know, way off or whatever. But I'm thinking, like, you're at, like, a specialized marketing school taking course X. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, I mean, it's really the same for me. I'm in the mechanical mechanical construction industry. Oh, cool. And um, my company installs heating and air conditioning and plumbing on a commercial scale. Like, people just this weekend asking me, like, oh, I, my sister was trying to tell tell you know, say what you did. And I, I was like, I, I couldn't, I yeah, have no idea. It's hard to explain. Yeah. yeah. But, um, so I'm taking a, a, a course on basic HVAC design mm -hmm. and like, I've been in the, in the industry for like six years and throughout the day, like people aren't telling you like every little thing, like, Hey, I need you to order this. And you're like, okay, I know how to do that. Yeah. What, but like, what is this? Or even if you know what it is, it's like, well, where does this go in the building? Or, right. So uh, like for me, this is basically like an engineering course, mm -hmm. um, at a, sort of a lighter scale, um, but I'm not even, like, in it that deep. I'm just really trying to get, like, big picture stuff out of it, like, yeah. connect some dots, like, where you're talking about this piece of equipment and how it works in the building and things like that. I mean, it's just a, just a nice continuing education type of course that, fortunately for me, is a five-minute bike ride from my apartment in the city. Oh, that's great, so, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it is, it is kind of nice, but it's been... Uh, it's been getting cold on the ride home. <laughs> I couldn't do it, dude. Yeah, when you, when you pulled up today to, to come into the studio and I saw you getting out the door and it's like, it feels like negative eight or whatever outside. And I see yeah. you running up. I'm like, get in here, get in here. It's so it, cold. It hasn't been that bad. And, and you know, really, I always tell people like, you know, you put the little Under Armour head thing on and mm -hmm. you can ride a bike in any temperature. So. Yeah, you just go. Yeah, you, you get the right piece of gear and then you know, like, all right, I take like 10 pedal strokes and I'm like warmed up, you know. Right. But it is a hard mental thing to get ready and go out the door. <laughs> Absolutely, man. And like even, so I mean, it's interesting you said that. So you're taking night classes Tuesdays and Thursdays. So like as you've sort of started to, to sort out since you've gotten married, it's, it's interesting how, and I think on some level this obviously exists just in, date, in relationships in general, not just marriages where you have to put in, you know, what you want to get out of it. So, I mean, sure. the relationship can only grow so much as much as you're around and communicating and all that. Good so point. It's, it's interesting, like, since we've been married, how it, it becomes that new balancing act of sorting out, okay, now you're living with this person, you've shared responsibilities and commitments, like, how do you sort out? your free time because right. like those nights those tuesday and thursday nights that now you're at school like those are that's valuable times like what's and it today been like? and today's monday so Anne's only got me on wednesday right, this week right. <laughs> so, so what's that been like for you with uh with Anne since you've been married uh 
I that's honestly Ann and I have been together almost three years. That's something I've never had to worry about. That's great. Um, I'm sure that's 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 like one of the top three reasons she's she's in in for the long haul. Yeah, um, right. But uh, it, it's it's something I think of like in my head, like oh man, like that kind of sucks more than like I'm worried that like she's gonna be upset that I'm not gonna be around. Mm. You know, I'm like oh man, like that means like I just said, oh that means we're not gonna like get to like sit around and do nothing together exactly. until Friday. Yeah, yeah, and you know any. Serious relationship, like you would understand that. Exactly, that, idea. that nothing time is yeah. valuable. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. but I was saying you don't have to be yeah. married to be like, oh, I exactly. get it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, for me as well. I mean, Chelsea's the same deal. I mean, I'm a, I'm a type A. I'm always trying to do things. Yes. And, you know, schedule. Like she she makes fun of me because I've linked our calendars, our f- iPhone calendars together. I have not thought to do that. Oh, with man. Anne. She but, might kill you if you do. Because Chelsea, like... We, <laughs> Anne might or Chelsea might and, well, in her defense or both. Because both. <laughs> okay. yeah. Chelsea's, uh, at this point, like, it's just hilarious because she'll look at her calendar. We just talked about this literally last night and she was like, I hate opening up my calendar because I always see it and I'm like, oh, it's great. I have a lot of stuff going on, but every single one of them is just stuff you're doing. <laughs> it's just like basically a, a dot on the counter that says Nathan will not be home. Yeah, Nathan <laughs> is doing a podcast with Kyle tonight, yep. so I won't be there. Yeah, so it is uh, it is interesting. Like, it's the same with her. I mean, she's really independent as a person, so I've never had to really worry about it either, which is also something I'm personally not used to. I mean, I don't know about you, but, like, in past relationships, I mean, it's always... No, that's not been typical for me either. Yeah, I mean, it's a weird thing because, you, again, maybe it's kind of our type, whatever you want to sure. call it, like, more organizational. Like, that's our mind. Our minds are always working in calendars and, and sorting things <laughs> out. But it is it is a strange thing because, like, with most... I don't think it's a girl-guy thing. I think it's just a people thing. Like, we generally want attention and we want to spend time with the people we care about. Right. But, I mean, I've... I always I feel like I'm split minded on it because if like tonight in my mind, I'm thinking I really miss Chelsea and I do wish that I was home hanging out with her. But on the same time, I'm like, I'm stoked to be here with Kyle. I'm not absolutely one way or the other. You know what I mean? Where yep. some people just are so detached. They don't care. It's like, oh, don't care that I'm not seeing my wife. I'm happy to be doing whatever I'm doing. Yeah. Or vice versa. Like, oh, I can't be doing this. I've got to be home with my wife. Yep. And so it's 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 been interesting uh sorting that with her because it's almost like a reverse psychology for me where i'm for a while i don't do this anymore but for a while i projected myself onto her for my past relationships right. where i assumed she cared more about this stuff than exactly she did. and she'd be like i really don't like go out and do but whatever that's also do. something her 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 response is something you're probably used to hearing that's like oh i don't care exactly but you're but used, you're, used to, you're used to hearing it with that <laughs> attitude like fine go out with your friends i don't exactly. care <laughs> but I mean, obviously, we're both. It's funny that we're both like coming to this realization. Like, yeah, like they're both the same way. I mean, that's why we, you know, we're both married now. Right. We found, found this person that's like, yes, like they get it, you know, yeah. or, or we we both get it together, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that's 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 a solid thing. So I got married in June. You got married in August. Um, you guys had lived together before you got married, correct? About yeah, about like a year and a half, I think, something like yeah, that. Yeah, about the same for us. But um, I wanted to ask you uh, how often. People ask, uh, how's married life? Mm, all the time. It's, I mean, it's obviously like the go-to question, but I've been yeah. like overanalyzing it now with <laughs> Anne or any, like any other friends that are married or, yeah. or anybody that wants to now ask me that, that I, you know, want to have an actual conversation with and not just be like, oh, it's good. See you. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Um, but I had asked you how long you would live together before. Cause to me, that question used to have. A, a pretty big, um, or I guess I should say that the answer used to come with a lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would want to say like 10 years ago, probably way more. Um, it was not typical to live together before right. I got married. So that was like, I think really the big question. It's like, how's married life, AKA like how's how living together, how, right. What, what did you find out about your partner now? Right. You know, and, and I, I mean, I would say anybody thinking about getting married, like live together for, Christ, at least a week, yeah. you know, <laughs> at least uh, a week. figure out the, uh, the things that are going to bother you about living with another person. Um, and just make sure you, you're in, you're into that for the rest of your life kind right. of thing. That's, dude, <laughs> that is the one area I have had so many conversations with people about this. I grew up in a pretty Christian 
communities. I mean, virtually everybody I knew that was that was close to growing mm-hmm. up. Obviously, those relationships altered and changed in the course of my adulthood. But the people I grew up with and stayed close with were all of the mindset that you gotta wait till marriage to get married and um, wait wait till marriage to live together. You mean? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice save. Uh, no, I follow what you're saying. And uh, <laughs> I zoned out there for a second too. I was like, huh? my, my brain just went to putty. <laughs> but um, it's it's interesting because yeah, like that sort of ideology comes with its own set, I guess, of ideas about how marriage ought to work and how people, like human beings work in general, where I guess the idea, if you're of that ideology, is that, you know, before you don't want to, it's mostly sexual, which we all, I guess, know at this point, like there's that element to which people of religion believe is like very sacred. So there's that aspect of it, but there's also just the, um, the aspect of like, the commitment of like the marriage ceremony itself is supposed to be this, um, you know, holy ritual that like unites the couple under God and that kind of just right. like sets the sets the tone or sets the stage for what the marriage is going to be. And I've had a bunch of these conversations with Christians and people that are on the other side of the fence, obviously, because I have friends that have done it both ways at this point. And for me, it's like I'm not at the point where I'd want to tell somebody how to live. Like I don't. I don't want to be like, yeah, you have to live together before you get married. But for me personally, like to, to what you just said, that's how I feel. Whereas with Chelsea and I, I mean, I would say from the time Chelsea and I moved in together for, for the first like eight months. Were, it you, was, were you engaged at that point? Yes. Yeah, so you we, got, were en- we okay. got engaged. We started looking for places together. It took us like six months to find one. Okay. So then we moved in. Nice. And that first like eight months or so that we were living together, it was hell yeah i mean it was just I and mean, that was there's a lot of personal stuff going on there was just a bunch that came out to, to your point about how you really got to get to know someone when you move in i mean we've been it makes a difference it does I mean, we've been dating for a, i think a year maybe at that point uh, maybe a little over a year and you know we knew each other we spent almost every single night together talked about everything we're on the same page about most things but you know just when you're sharing an intimate space with someone like obviously all that upends and it's really difficult i think it, it becomes this like it, I, I see both perspectives in, in this sense where in the sort of i don't know if this started with millennials or what generation this started with but it, at some point uh people started to look at marriage as a not so committal thing where it's like okay i might get married but i can get out of this with a divorce type of thing right. so the sort of mindset culturally shifted at some point in the past 50 years pretty substantially so like from a Christian perspective, I guess, there's like, or not just Christian, but any religion that believes that aspect that you should be married before you move in. It's the idea that when you get married, you've essentially locked yourself in. Right. Like you've essentially, and there's obviously a bad way of looking at that, like, oh, you're trapped, you can't get out. There's also, I think, the the positive way of looking at it, which is like, okay, now that you've committed your lives to each other in this way you've committed to this sense of you know we're in this for the long haul like for better or worse yep. just like the marriage vows so Team. yeah so i mean i i get the sentiment of that i don't agree with it at this point but it is it has been really interesting because i agree with you to the point where when we moved in and we started sorting all that stuff out i mean we literally if we hadn't if we'd gotten married before all that mm-hmm. and then all that would have come out afterward i mean that would have been such a bad way to start a marriage right you know like it felt so good to start a marriage knowing we had gotten through all those issues and kind of sorting out that intimate space of living together yeah you know so. yeah it can, it can be tricky and warned me um as we decided we, like we were going to look for a place um like her only concern was like you don't know like what I do mm. after work when I'm not hanging out with you and I'm like what are you like getting into <laughs> trouble or something She's stuff like, for you yeah into. right that's that's where my mind went she's like no like I just I'll just like sit around like is that gonna be a problem I'm like no like you're like, perfect yeah that's us yeah that's what we're gonna <laughs> do then yeah you do that and I'll tinker with my bike in the corner of the room like yeah. it's you know there, there's nothing wrong with having a, a difference like that but. Gosh, I would say finding that out, yeah, after it's like, oh, wedded bliss, like, everything, this is great. Yes. And then, like, oh, I didn't know you did that, mm-hmm. you know? So having that kind of stuff sorted out, uh, I, I think, is for the better. Um, but, 
Because you, you, you could do it any which way. You can, and and some work this way, and some don't. You know, because obviously there's people that have did a certain like didn't get didn't move in before they got married, and they're right. still together happily, and it's all worked out. Or like I know this one couple that are in their late thirties, good friends of mine, and um, they went through a period. I think they got married in their like early twenties type of thing, and they went through a period in their late twenties for like four or five years where I've talked to um, the guy about this situation, and it was just like hell. He's very open about like it was just a disaster. I mean, he was like a mental. He was just going through a lot of stuff, and right. then she was having to carry a lot of that. And obviously, I don't know the extent, all the details, but essentially, I mean, coming out of that period, they're like the happiest. Like they're like I don't know how many years it's been since they've been good, but I mean, when you see them together now, it's like wow. Like they're like they whatever that was. I mean, obviously, it made them stronger. So. I think it's it definitely can work both ways, but there's something about like the the wedding itself setting the stage of expectations into the marriage. Right. Where if you're if you haven't sorted that stuff out and then it all comes flooding out the gates, yeah, that's that's a downer. I mean, right, like realizing really you. realizing we just got married and like we're we're just finding this out that we have to like have this argument about this thing in the house or something. Yeah. Like it would definitely be a, a setback, but. To to the point of your friends and uh, like you said they're still together right, mm-hmm. um, that's probably a little early on for the type of stuff that is going to happen in a marriage. But like that's that's what it's about. So that's a perfect example. Yeah, like they got married when they're twenty, so that's much younger than you or I, I guess. But um, like I'm sure we're going to have those problems in the next like oh, five course. or ten years. That that yeah. like yeah, like we're going to probably think like oh my god, how do we make it through that? Mm-hmm. But you know, I'm like, I have grandparents and my parents are divorced, but, uh, plenty of folks that I know that are still married that I'm like, yeah, that's how you do it. Like, just right. like that. And, and they're not telling you all the stories like that you knew about your friend, probably. Exactly. You, you just see the good stuff. Yep. You know? It's only been in recent years that my own parents have talked to me about their struggles in marriage early on, which I, I that's, mean, that's, that's good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, like, obviously growing up, you want the stability you want, even if it is a facade, you know, like you're, you're taking in from your parents or your guardians, whoever it is, you know, the information about the world and you're forming psychological structures in your head. And it's good to, it's good to know, like I, I, for the most part thought growing up that everything was dandy. And then recently my parents talked to me about tons of stuff they were going through. And that's, it's, it is so, I think, and I think the more time goes on now, especially with social media, it's kind of forcing people to be more vulnerable to oh, yeah. a degree, oh, you know, yeah. because like if he, word spreads quicker. Like everything, even everything's out there. Yeah, like even if you and I aren't sharing statuses about our relationships or whatever's going on, just the fact that like if you're going through something with Anne and you talk to me about it, and then I talk to Chelsea about it, and then all it takes virtually no time at all for like your close friend circle to know, like oh, Kyle and Anne are going through something. And right. So it's just <laughs> you know, people, and you know, I think it's always been that way. Like people know word spreads about whatever in general but i think it's good it's like a net good overall that people are more aware that like people life's not the perfect thing that uh sometimes social media or like outwardly we paint exactly to be (laughs) it's not what the uh it's not really what the festival looked like on the internet it's It's a fire yeah it's uh (laughs) there are bumps in the road you know yeah absolutely but uh, so the the reason i brought that up was to to ask how many times you've been asked that question and that's just what i've been doing as of late it's like people used to ask that and they used to probably have a lot to tell you but like now it's just like how's married life like it's it's great you yeah. know i mean i know we're both in a very similar situation like you said earlier like chelsea yeah. gets gets your you know your scheduling and she knows that you're probably not going to just be like sitting around much that you like to stay yep. busy and things Always like that busy. like yeah, yeah so having somebody that understands that and I'm in the same position, like, yeah, of course, like it just, it makes sense. So, yeah. What's been for you guys since you've been married, what do you think has been the biggest hurdle or like learning curve of living together and being together? Since, since we moved in or since we got married, either, like, either or. I'm trying to think if like if things if there's like something changed. that stands out. Um, cause you guys just seem perfect. No offense. But <laughs> thank you. you. Seem like a pretty no offense. You seem like a pretty good match. Take a peek behind the curtain. Um, yeah, I don't know. We, uh, I'm borderline OCD. You know, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe actually, uh, if I could find a doctor. Um, but that kind of stuff around the house is like really the only thing that we like 
kind of bicker about. Right, because you're very neat and clean. Yep. You like things a certain way. Yep. And, yep. It, and it happens, like, you know, and at this point I just, like, kind of know really when I should just keep my mouth shut. And, and a lot of times, like, I don't really, like, care that much about it. But, like, just saying it and being like, hey, why is that over there? Mm-hmm. It's just better, I think, than, like, keeping it in. Like, oh, my God, yeah. Like, I don't expect Dan to be like, oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Let me get up right now and change that. Right. But just say, oh, whatever. Or sometimes I'm like, just tell me to shut up sometimes, yeah, will you? Yeah, you know? Because, yeah. like, I know I'm, like, kind of neurotic about it. Like, you know, I want everything, like, put away and clean and all that kind of stuff. But um, that's that's probably the... The biggest thing. And yeah. and as we've been together longer, <clears throat> I probably feel more comfortable to pick out those things. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, since getting married, I'm sure it's only gotten worse where I, like, come home right away <laughs> and I'm like, what the heck? You know? <laughs> it's so good that you're self-aware to it, though. I am, I mean, that's... but it's like, you know, it's it's a blessing and a curse. My house looks really clean, but there's also... Oh, I just mean self-aware per- to that. Oh, I know, that. I know. Yeah, yeah. Knowing that, I'm, yeah, that yeah. I do bring it up and when I should or shouldn't kind of thing, but but that's really the, the extent of it. That's interesting, man. What about you guys? Oh, man, there's so much. We, 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 <laughs> <laughs> we worked through a Pick ton. one. <laughs> I mean, the biggest, honestly, there's a lot. I think there's two two major things between us that we went through. I don't know how much we've talked about this before. I mean, the, the number one was, and this was inevitable, this came up a little later, I think, in the relationship, at least full front. Like, it didn't show its face early on, which is just our glaring personality differences. Okay. We're like... At a general level, they complement each other because Chelsea's much, she's easygoing. She's just like, I'll, I'm content doing whatever. And she's not natural, like temperamentally, she doesn't have a very strong ego. So, and I have a very strong ego. Okay. So they kind of, you know, there's, there's like a weaving in and out process of, of all that. So that portion, I guess, of the relationship showed its head later on because she she got into she became a vegan okay a few months into the relationship so basically and we've talked about this a lot in in therapy and with friends how essentially like since since we started dating this is her words not mine since we started dating <laughs> um she has described it as she's basically changed like did a 180 as a person and that she's felt like she's kind of come into herself as like a she's figured out her identity i right. guess in a way where she just hadn't really sorted out before and you know call that what you want i mean i guess any good relationship should you know bring out that in a partner like you should be always sharpening each other to figure out like who each of you are and all that i I agree yeah yeah and and she was at a point i think where her whole life because she is so easygoing and just go with the flow she's always had very um just you know like whatever her viewpoint like she's had viewpoints but i think her viewpoints have been more um loose with stuff like she's not very opinionated so like if we were arguing like if or if like you and i or you and her were arguing or whatever she would say what she thinks but she's not going to like get heated about it most likely. similar to me i i feel i feel her on that level yeah 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 so i think when she we started dating and she started to kind of get a feel for my ego and how strongly i felt about things which she's admired since the beginning sure. of the relationship i think that kind of rubbed off on her in a way where it was like oh like if i'm going to be talking about whatever my opinions on politics or spirituality or whatever altruism are with this guy like i want to know what i think about it too so i mean obviously this is i don't want to pontificate any further than that right it's, it's her feelings and thoughts sure. on it. but i know she's said that to me and our therapist whereas when she then fell into veganism, it was one of those things where, like, she's always been an animal lover since growing up. And um, that was always just, like, a big part of her life. She's a very sensitive, very empathetic type person. And her sister was a vegetarian. So, I mean, it was always kind of on the table. Like, she was aware of it. But she was, it's, you know, like any cognitive dissonance. Like, just, like, I have my, my laptop and my smartphone and things that are clothes that are made by slave labor. And <laughs> right, all that right. stuff that, like, we have to, like, go day to day trying not to think about just so we can function. Sure. I think it was just one of those things where that was how it was for her. And when she went into it, it became like a full fledged ideology, like almost to a stereotypical vegan degree. Sure. You know, like where it's just people think like, oh, vegans are like almost religious with it. It got that strong with her at first. And obviously over the course of time, the more people she's talked to about it, the more 
excuse me, the more research she's done, she's kind of settled into her own, you know, per, like personality wise. Now she can kind of mix and match like when to talk about it, when to draw right. back. You know, she's right. not she's not as like glaring about it as she was at that point. But when she was, she's done her research, I mean, it's not brand new anymore. Exactly. And when it is, you probably want to. Hey, what do you like? Maybe without saying, what do you think about it? Exactly. You, you tell them what you think and hope that they kind of give you some back. You get that visceral reaction where yeah. it's just like it's it's a heart thing, so, and it and it has that same effect as a religion or like a social justice style belief, where like if you're someone, whether it's I don't know, like Black Lives Matter or feminism or whatever it might be, social issues in general, I think, especially in today's climate, like people attach them really close to their identity and sure. like how they strongly they feel about the world. So it became that type of thing where. She saw a pocket of, you know, our friends and family where no one's really talking about this issue. And then when she would talk about it, she was getting a lot of backlash and, you know, like people aren't familiar Understandably with it. so. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just like it's a not, it's a foreign type of thing. So there was a long process of her and I arguing about it and going back and forth. And it took some sorting out between the two of us. But because of that development in her, it was like... It showed the worst parts of my ego to her in that vulnerable okay. state. You know yeah. what I mean? Because she was in like a a new ideology and like a new understanding of the world, and here I am, this like ego maniac. Who's <laughs> and I've thought about this. Like I have, you know, I'm I'm a philosophy nerd. Like a lot, most not most, but a lot of philosophers are vegans or vegetarians because right. like the sort of altruistic angle of like do the least amount of suffering or commit to the least amount of suffering in the world type of thing, and. uh so yeah, I was just a total pompous douche, probably, and so many of these conversations because she's like bringing stuff up, and and you're like, no, uh, this is this actually, is what it's like. Well, actually, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Just, like probably, I, I don't even remember half the conversations, but there's probably a lot of that. So I'm sure that helped though too. I mean, I, it's funny because yeah. I I don't like have like strong opinions really, but a lot of people like you or my like my good friend Mike is also now a vegan, mm-hmm. and like he feels a certain way about a lot of things, and like I just I don't like chime in that much i just kind of like take it all in but uh to have someone like you like to to at least know certain things to be like well actually like you said well actually right this is how that works or this is how that really is i mean at least uh at least she has somebody with some some background and information and she knows i'll push back so it's like that's like actually it's kind of our job as the friend the spouse whatever it is like exactly i might agree with you completely but like are you sure like Like, devil's advocate absolutely yeah so i have have the the tendency personality wise and i know i'm ranting at this point but i mean i i have that tendency to kind of take that to its extreme okay because of my ego so i mean all it's yeah it becomes to a fault where i can play devil's advocate i'm naturally a contrarian like people like you've listened to a few episodes of this podcast like if i know there's a couple people that have listened to almost every episode and i'm sure people who listen to episode to episode i'm talking to people about different subjects with different opinions on things but the way <laughs> like, what does this guy really think yeah exactly yeah. Like the way depending on the guest depending on my mood i mean like i have if you if you boil it down to what i think obviously i have fundamental beliefs about the world at, in their totality but it would depend on who i'm talking to and the mood i'm in i mean i might just be in the mood to play more of a devil's advocate or ask for conversation questions. purpose yeah like some, at the very least because yeah. i'm a douche and a nerd <laughs> like it's like there's things together so anyway all that said with her and i it as we grew together with that it kind of put a wedge between us because she grew in this one direction and i just couldn't commit to that direction fully in the way because it was one of those things where I was caught between do I show solidarity in this relationship and commit to this thing for the sake of the relationship or do I stay true to what I actually think and and kind of keep my mind open and work with her and like kind of compromise yeah. as we go. So that's what ended up happening and we obviously we're at a place now where we talk about this kind of stuff pretty frequently and we're pretty open cool. with each other but that's been like the the wedge ever since that point that she really started to develop opinions and ego and now and it's it's not as natural to her so like when she gets mad like if we're arguing i get energized it depletes her <laughs> yeah you know what i mean like i if we're arguing i could just do it for hours and 
I get heated and I, I can, I, I just, I don't even realize how I sound. Like I, she tells me all the time, I sound like a, a dick and I don't know it. Like I'm just right. kind of, you're just going, yeah, I'm just going. Whereas with her, I mean, it's a lot more visceral and she's a lot more sensitive and it's one of those things where it's just an ongoing learning curve, like for both of us. That's but, good. But since that point, that was two years ago now, I mean, since that point or over, over two years ago, we've uh, obviously grown a lot together and learned from each of those instances, we we try to not push each other's buttons past right. a certain point. You it's, a, know? it's a good place to start. Yeah. And I mean, that, I think that's pretty <laughs> cool that you got to kind of experience that whole change for her. Yeah. Um, and, and her to have you there to, uh, you know, feel everything out on and, you know, be a dick about it. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure like in the moment it didn't feel like that at all for her. She felt like, ah, oh, this, this guy, what have I got myself into? But now it's, yeah, now we've both made it through. It's similar to what we've been saying about marriage and commitment and all this. It's like, you know, you know, when you're with someone that you love and you know, they love you and there's trust and there's, there's compatibility and there's all these things that, you know, so c- many factors Yeah, that accumulate to a great relationship. You know, when you have those things that there's some parts of it that are worth fighting for and that's obviously a part of it that could have easily been you know the wedge that drove us apart but we both were committed to not let that happen so good yeah it's interesting man good for you guys yeah relationships you know we'll talk about it more this weekend we're still (laughs) we're still hanging out right (laughs) yeah definitely i can't wait double date cool but yeah i know you talked uh before we we got on you wanted to talk about Firefest. Tried to transition there, but I wanted to hear yeah, more about we, your Yeah, we, we kind of had it uh, <laughs> almost, like, perfectly done there, I guess. Um, Maybe I could do some editing. It was like... just, uh, I mean, I just wrote a few things down to what we could possibly discuss today, and I was like, I just watched it, and of course I came in and asked you, had you seen it? And you're like, yeah, I watched both of them this weekend. I was like, oh, I did the exact same thing. <laughs> Perfect. And I feel like for you, this is, like, so in your wheelhouse. Like, you're, you're going to be doing, like, a case study on this. I mean, <laughs> some of your... Uh, your work on the internet has already ended up in textbooks. So like, it's so weird. Yeah. But I mean, congrats really like that. You've really Thanks, hit man. quite a stride and, and I'm a, I'm a lot a, of luck. I'm a follow. Well, hey man, that's with everything. I mean, yeah. come on. My, I went, met my wife on Tinder. Like, <laughs> what you want to talk about that's luck? That's a great example. Yeah. It's so true. Um, Life is luck. But, uh, it just seems like very relevant. And we've said a bunch of times through the conversation about social media and, you know what it what it does and these influencers and right. that kind of thing i mean my mind was just kind of blown about the whole uh the the whole, about both documentaries yeah. really and i had uh i had been paying attention to fire festival and this is it'll be in april it would have supposed to have been happening 2 years ago right, in april 2017 yeah right yeah. so the only reason I probably heard about it was because Blink-182 was on the bill. Right. And I yes. said to Anne yes. the other night, I'm like, thank God. I'm like, one, I wasn't that desperate to see Blink-182. And if it was in 2016, I already probably had tickets to see them in, like, August of that year. Yeah. But there was a very, like, small possibility that, like, if I had not seen them in the past, like, 10 years, and this was the one opportunity, mm-hmm. like, I could have been one of those people. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Because of the band. Like, all the... Uh, the the beach wild party stuff is not my scene, but right. um, after seeing the both documentaries through, I'm just like, wow! Like, the internet has so much power, yeah. And and a lot of people don't care to do their research. Mm-hmm. Like I I made the comparison to Anne and and said, you know, some of these people saw this event posted, and within 24 hours, they spent thousands of dollars for something they really didn't even know what it was. Right. And I'm like, I spent the last, like, five months researching a pair of sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> and I just finally got them because I found it at, like, perfect. the lowest price after <laughs> that much time of looking. So I'm like, right, right. <laughs> that stuff just seems so bizarre to me. Um, I, I don't spend money like that. And, and in this day and age, like we have the opportunity to be like the most informed consumer you could ever be. Right. We have all the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So to see people doing that, like, and I know like the the people, people do this all the time, like spend money they don't have or just spend every dime and not concern themselves with saving or preparing for the future at all. And I, I just, I couldn't believe it. And a lot of those kids were, like, rich, you know, trust fund yeah. type, like, influencers. And, and that's, that's a stereotype, probably, but, like, that's 
it's it's, it's easy to though. say like yeah, oh I I agree as well but I'm just saying like there's definitely some people probably like me Absolutely. that were like yep. oh my gosh this bill for this show is perfect like yeah. I I got to go well, it worked both ways too I think to um so such a shame though I know <laughs> <laughs> so so there's the, the the portion of it which is like the sort of rich whatever you want to call it the rich privileged kids who got these sponsored influencer posts and they thought oh I, this is a just a party i can't wait to just blow money going to this party for whatever it's worth so there's that portion of it but then there is the portion of just like your av- average consumer who also went to this because i think and chelsea and i both thought this when we watched we watched both of them in one night okay and um i took a day break oh yeah it's probably better full disclosure. cleanse yeah. your palate <laughs> but but uh we both thought this um at the end of the we watched the the hulu one first and then the netflix one and we we did it the opposite really oh well, we'll, we'll get into that yeah, so yeah. We, we, we contrasting <laughs> thoughts but we thought so it was probably like six months maybe prior to watching these. We actually watched a short documentary on Firefest okay. that a, a YouTuber named Internet Historian did. I'll send you this video. Please this do. guy, he's he became one of my favorite YouTubers the past year. I mean, he is it's he does mostly internet style uh storytelling where it's like it's events like Firefest that have happened and they become a whole scandal or a big dramatic thing and he does like basically entertaining short style videos investigating what happened and why it happened and what went down yeah. yeah he's just like a character online but anyway he did i think it was maybe like a 10 or 15 minute long video on this there's like a lot of animated just him going through the facts of what he knew and that's why cool. it was crazy yeah so both when we both saw this video we we're like that's insane and after we watched the netflix one and the tulu ones we um we both said to each other like the one thing i felt like they both of them missed out that that guy covered is the fact that and i i can I, source check this anyone listening you can obviously google this yourselves too i mean i don't have i can't google it right now yeah check but, um, our facts please yeah but i'm 99 percent sure in that guy's video he stated that there's no evidence because the whole thing was a scam there's no evidence on the paperwork that we've seen that the people who bought the tickets ever bought any tickets above the price of i think it was like a couple two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars yes so like on the website there's like Tickets that literally went up to like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the grand. Yeah, but there's no evidence they were ever bought. Okay. So it's like when it, when he said when the whole thing was like quote unquote sold out. I mean that was obviously they just closed the site down. That was like the GA tickets. But exactly. That, but general, still a three thousand. Still a ton of money. Or whatever but, the whatever but, the but number for what was. What it was worth? It was supposed to be like a two week villa, you know, vacation. It was with over a bunch two weekends. Bands. Yes. Yeah. So it's like a. It was you were getting a lot out of it. So I mean I think for. To, just to the point of, like you said, obviously not all. It wasn't all like rich, privileged kids. There were obviously some probably average consumers who looked at this and said, "That's a un- literally an unbelievable deal for what we're right. getting out of right. it." So I'll, I'd commit to that. So <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Like that, I don't know. Obviously, for a fact, I don't know if anybody does at this point if that's been released. But yeah, then the whole the whole thing was nuts. Like, what, what were your initial thoughts watching the documentaries? Um, super impressed that this <laughs> that got that can far. be done like yeah. that and but really like if you think about it they it, it it could have been like sort of what they were showing it to be right and like what if that went down yeah like they were saying oh this is going to change the you know the face of music festivals you know going forward mm-hmm. and not that i was like hoping that would happen i'm not a you know festival goer yeah um but i just i was like amazed by the whole thing and um, I I think that that uh, that Billy McFarlane's like kind of crazy, but um, definite sociopath. Yeah, like in a certain way, I guess. But like, um, everything was like just crazy to see that like these people bought into that, and then this guy and nobody like or not enough people or not loud enough along the way was like, yo, hold on, time right, out, right, right. Like we can do this festival. And we can do the tent thing, but it turns out we can only afford FEMA tents. Mm-hmm. So in my line of thinking or in my work, when something like that comes up, okay, we let them know. Here's, you know, here's the change. Here's what's going on. And then, you know, what to expect. I mean, it was like they were deleting comments on, you know, people asking like, hey, what is what is the festival grounds? What are they looking like? We're, you know, a week out. I'd love yeah. to see 
you know, see a picture of it, what's going on. Yeah. And if they just uh, did a little bit of Google research at the time, there was enough people, like, tweeting out yep. the, you know, the facts, I guess, of what was really happening. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I'm, like I said earlier, I'm not that opinionated. I'm going to sh- throw a big opinion out here now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Drop it. I don't, I don't think it was a sham to begin with. Like, I don't think they were setting it up to, well, uh, I, I, let me clarify that I don't think they were like setting this whole thing up to get all these people down there only to like have it fall apart at the last off. second. Right, right, yeah. Right, right. I mean, maybe like the villas turning into FEMA tents, they may have known that all along and they were really trying to like upsell certain packages or something. But, but I don't think like the idea of the festival and getting people to a, you know, quote unquote private island or whatever, like, I don't think it, the, initially they all got together like, yeah, let's let's rip these these people off. Right. And there's definitely some element of that because you see what this guy's businesses were before and during and after. Yeah. Because uh, he was like in debt to companies trying to pay debts yeah. to companies through company. It was like multiple layers of pain. Yeah. And I'm like, does this is he ever going to get rich? Like, yeah. what? <laughs> like, you got to make it work somewhere here, buddy. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. I, I but generally just like just impressed like of the power that the internet has these days um uh, maybe a little bit scared mm-hmm. um you know future children like i hope this isn't as powerful in 10 years as it is now to the point where that, that term shuts down the internet like you know the, i was impressed with like the media team too that like they came up with this thing like everybody at the same time and i've had thoughts like this like Everybody in the band needs to post about this at noon tomorrow. Yeah. And yeah. then everybody that follows, it's like, then then you can't miss it. Like, you're going to see. And then if you see it and you scroll past mine a little too quick, you're going to catch up to Tim's post later. Exactly. And after you got drunk Saturday night, you're going to wake up Sunday morning and you'll see Bruno's post and be like, oh, that's right. Yeah. I forgot they were playing. That like, was the most genius part to me was the orange uh, yeah. Instagram picture where it really does, it's an eye stopper when you're scrolling. Yep, that and I, I thought that was cool and, and just, uh, you know, innovative and if only that could be used for something a little... More productive and real, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My initial thoughts, like you said, I mean, I don't know... And, and I'm no expert. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, no, I, I, you're, I, you're actually sort of in I mean, this business, I, but or of the the right. uh, marketing side of things. But um, you know, as a as a concert goer and just a, you know a, a planner in general in my small life, yeah, it was like amazing to see like what really did go into it exactly and, and also as a contractor i i'm watching this budget get put together in you know rapid speed mm-hmm. and ending up with like we can do all this everything you just asked for we can do all of it in this short yeah. period of time like eight million dollars that's your price tag it's so hard talking about it because i think the vision like to what you're saying right now about the vision of making this whole thing happen and, and putting together the teams and coordinating all these moving pieces at once. I think there's that elements of it, which obviously there's some genuineness to that and to the people that were working on the project right. and to the intentions. They were of, all in. They, yeah. This, they, was, this was their livelihood. They believe that they were going to six months yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to do something. But I think the problem with talking about this in any scale is that it's built on an industry that is so easily, um, I don't want to say it's fake, but it's it's built on, a lot of it is built on being fake. It's like a fake until you make a type of industry. Like there's, True. There's, a, there's a lot of real influencers out there. There's people like your Kendall Jenners or whoever that are actually famous people that have millions of organic followers right. that have a, a built-in brand that it you could pay them millions of dollars to do this type of thing and it makes sense like yes. they they have the whole thing built in they're a real thing but alongside of that you have for every one influencer like that who's real you have a thousand who are fake trying to seem like they're real so right. that's a whole to gain to gain the following to yeah, because grab it, the attention because instagram i mean i i mean i talk about this with friends a lot i mean instagram is a platform it's beautiful it's, it's just as beautiful as it is horrible i mean i guess you could say that about a lot of platforms but i mean in the sense that it's built on aesthetics so yeah. when you're scrolling through whether you're following you know a photographer or a small business or a musician or a local bike shop whatever it is right. the pictures that you are your eye is attracted to are the most attractive pictures like you're you're looking for what looks 
good or whatever that you're personally sure. into. So, I mean, that's built into the model of Instagram as a whole. And then influencers come in to exploit that by being like the most sexy, the most desired people where like they're posing in these extravagant outfits and all over the world. And yep. they, they want the background and the yeah. people they're with. It's and... a whole setup. I mean, like you, you see this <laughs> everywhere from like Coachella to, to people who pay. Like I, I was just uh, I forget if it was in the fire um documentary or fire festival documentaries or somewhere else no it was in it was in some other documentary i think i was watching where there's a company in russia where you pay to be on a private jet for, it was for, featured in there was it in there it was in one of the uh, one of the two right. not in both but yeah to so just sit in the just plane just sit in it and get pictures where yeah. you look like you're living this extravagant lifestyle and i saw that in the in the documentary and was like one that's insane that people do that mm-hmm. and two like I gotta come up with something like that. <laughs> you know? I, like, I. Absolutely. It, it's yep. kind of easy to play into, and like, that's like the oldest, like, American dream, like, kind of thing. Like, I, I wanna create something that people right. want, and. I want to be able to support my family off of it. Right. You know, it's like like a musician. I want to write the hit record that everybody buys, and then I can send my kid to college. Exactly. So, you there's, know. so there's two sides of that coin. So like yeah. There's that side of the coin, and it's the same as what I do for a living with the social media stuff with staking. Right. It's like there's the side of the coin that is like I want to be an innovator. I want to be creative. I want to come up with something that people are going to want to do. I mean, this is the case with half – most of the stuff that we use today, it's like prior to Amazon, no one needed Amazon. Amazon came <laughs> along, created a need, and now all of a sudden everyone needs Amazon. It's yep. like it's like that with clothing. Like you, you, There's a new clothing brand that comes out, and like prior to that, no one needed that clothing brand. But all of a sudden now it's like everybody has to have this hat or whatever it is. So it's like there's that part of it, which is just the natural consumer-driven aspect of living in a, like a capitalist economy, where it's right. marketing, this is just what we, the, this is the landscape that we live in, so that's... Like pre- or post-internet even, you know, yeah, like that stuff just, exists. It's always been it, going yeah. on in the past, I mean, it, I, I guess you could say since after World War II, especially. Door-to-door vacuum salesman. Exactly, yeah. like this has just been this whole idea of selling, like we all... Everything that we use is stuff that we don't need. Like, I mean, you think basic right. needs are just food, shelter, <laughs> whatever. Like, everything on top of that, it's like, okay, my laptop, my phone, like, my like nice clothing, whatever it might be. Yeah. So, I think there's that side of it, which is the more pragmatic and hopeful and idealistic look outlook on it. But then there's the other side, which is, like, the way that the, the ca- capitalist, consumerist model, whatever you want to call it, is built within social media, it feels like it's going off a cliff. Because it feels like when you see something like Firefest, it's the sign of things to come. Where like this, as a structure, can't exist the way it exists right now right. forever. Because I mean, like what what we're doing is we just keep perpetuating. We want better looking. We want more efficient. We just keep wanting better and better and better. And the truth is, like when you look at something like Fire Festival, the vast, the ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people in the world could never dream of going, affording to go to Fire Fest or right. or living that type of lifestyle. But it's the Hollywood ideal that's always been there is since however long Hollywood and like mainstream pop culture has been around. Right. And now with social media and s- platforms like Instagram. It's done something to our psychology or like we have this phone in our hands and now every single day it's like daunting. It's like it's sitting there waiting to be picked up and you go scrolling through it and you can't even if you're the most self-aware person like I don't I consider myself pretty self-aware and when I scroll through Instagram I'm not thinking consciously. I give a shit about this <laughs> right. musician or artist or that's doing better than me. Yeah. But I mean, on a subconscious level, that's affecting you no matter what. You're like right. You, even if we're not thinking about it. So when I look at Firefest as a whole and like that whole situation, it's like impossible for me to separate those two things from my mind because when I see that Billy McFarland guy and this whole idea, like I agree. I don't, I don't know what his intentions were. I don't know. Maybe he, he's obviously a snake oil salesman. Like he's obviously yes. like he's everybody in those documentaries was saying like he's when he speaks, like he's 
trying to convince the whole room. Like he has that aura about him. And you can't so, like, say he's not good at it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so he's, he's like a salesman. So it's like, that's sure. There's that element of him as a person, but I don't, I'm not in his head. Like, I don't know. Maybe this whole, like maybe part of him when he met Ja Rule and, and all those other influencers and people, rich people he was hanging out with. I'm sure being in that culture, part of him did think like, this is the coolest thing I could offer the world is like, I would offer people a slice of right. this lifestyle. So it kind of and both it, ways. Look I don't know. how attractive it was. Yeah. Everybody jumped on. And I mean, still is. There was something there. It, it could happen again. Yeah, that's what people are, <laughs> people are saying. Like if he gets yeah. out of jail, like a couple of years. Well, like, I mean, they said that they were talking about doing it in 2018, like yeah. before all the like real trouble came. Right. But um, these you know social media tools essentially now as as they're being used are really in this case, and they said this in the documentary, or weapons mm-hmm. um, uh, are powerful. Yeah. And. Uh, I know you're the host, but I could sort of bring this back around to our first conversation. Um, you uh, and Bruno actually got me to download Instagram Nuh-uh. on our first little road trip up to Boston. Wow. And my first uh, picture that I posted was in a rest stop in the snow on the way up oh, I was so cold. To, to Boston. Yeah. When I think it was like March or something. Like it, it shouldn't have been. Yeah. We got hit with a crazy it was, snowstorm. It was un- and... unexpected. Yes. But um I've I've had it since then, and uh, at that time, you were just like following your buddies, mm-hmm. um, exactly. And More there was intimate. nothing that was like, I mean, at least for me, that was like, oh my gosh, like I wish I had that, or like everybody was just just your friends. Like, you want to see yeah. what everybody's up to, and it was like more of a, a personal thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, it has gotten way you know like now and i don't know when it really kind of took place like like as once celebrities started using instagram basically mm-hmm. or or any or any you know twitter or facebook or anything like that <clears throat> but um i've uh, ann has gone like off and off of in, off and on from instagram and um she says like sometimes it would bum her out like she'd look at stuff and be like oh like that's like either that's depressing or that makes me depressed or, or, yeah. yeah, But so for me, luckily I've like everything I pay closer attention to anyhow is like, it's like inspiring anyhow. Like, and it may not, that may not be the person's intent. They're just like, they just posted a picture of their bike ride and I'm like, Oh, I got to go out on my bike tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like I got to stop putting it off or I don't care if it's cold. I'm going out or I see a picture of the guy on tour and I see his drum set and I'm like, Ooh, maybe maybe I could clean my symbols. Uh-huh. You know, so I like yeah. I try to use it to like <laughs> motivate me or like make me excited about the things that I do. Like I follow all the stuff that like I like to do in life. But, right. Yeah. Um but the idea of like following people to like really want to like be that or be in that lifestyle is yeah. just like it's like celebrity worship. It's yeah. like, what, like I'm aspiring to be like Kim Kardashian or like I'm aspiring to be like whoever this person is that's beautiful and posting pictures in, like, right. the Alps or, or, you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> yeah. like, that's, it's this idealistic thing that we do. And, we, and we've always done it. Like, People Magazine, like, like yes. Hollywood. Like, we've yes. always followed celebrity <laughs> culture like that. But True. with it in our hands, like, it's 24-7. Like, Absolutely. C- celebrities can post any time of the day, and it's just it's nonstop. It's a, it, to me, like, it would be nice if instead of, like, seeing the picture of Kendall Jenner in this ridiculous background, this amazing vacation spot... Instead of, like, being jealous, like, that should make you work harder. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you know what? I'm going to save some money. So, like, maybe I'm not going to go to the exact location she was in, but I can get a pretty, you know, inexpensive flight to Florida and go spend the weekend with my significant other yeah. and do our version of that. Right. You know? Like, Wouldn't it be nice if more people thought like that? If it, like, yeah, use it as, like, motivation. Like, don't yeah. be bummed you don't have it. Like, but the al- it's try all and find you. your own thing. That, the problem is that it's all against you. It's like, the, you've, like you're working against the stack deck. True. Where, like, someone like you, <laughs> where you're, like, for someone like me or you, I mean, like, our lives are fairly comfortable compared to most. And it's like, well we said, yes. look at these things, it's a lot easier to step outside and be like, oh, like, that's neat. And we don't think as much about it. Whereas some people who are struggling or whatever, they look at it and they're, right. yep. it's easily overwhelming. But like, yeah, you're right, though, for even just me personally, when I started working on Stakeham's Twitter account, like one of the biggest motivating factors was right when I started working on it. It was in August of 2017. 
um, the the brand Moon Pie, which is now one of like mm-hmm. the household brand names on Twitter, they launched their first like massive viral tweet, which is still to this day is their biggest tweet. And it was you've a, talked uh, about it on the podcast. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Like the the lunar eclipse type of thing, and it got like uh, I forget how many hundreds of thousands of retweets. I mean, it's one of the biggest brand tweets of all time. And I at that time, I mean, I was so new to the whole platform insofar as being a brand on it. I didn't really know how to be or what was like what the space looked like outside of my small circle. And I used that as like a means to as a driver to be like, okay, like this is this is like the brand to beat. Yeah. almost. Do you know what I mean? Like I in my mind, I wasn't thinking because at the time, Stakem had literally. I think maybe a thousand inact- inactive <laughs> followers, right, no right. good tweets, no traction. And uh, I'm thinking I could be better than that. It's I good ra- motivation. Yeah, I could write better tweets than that. I'm yeah. just like this douchey. <laughs> like you kind of, yeah, you're like that's having the ability to do that is really key. But I think it is hard when you're working against the stack deck of what the aesthetic lore of Instagram specifically and just uh, that, that whole culture, that whole celebrity influencer culture. It's just so... It's. I don't want to call it toxic because it doesn't have to be toxic. Right. But there's people who have completely healthy relationships with those people that they follow. Right. But, and that's I mean, kind of what I'm trying to like promote, I guess. Yeah. Like, like it, you can. It's not, it's not so bad. But it, but for most people, I think it's more. I, I even if it's just like sixty forty percent. Like I think most people it oh, slides yeah. in the direction of like having more negative effect. I mean, to your quite like you you kind of brought this up earlier you didn't directly ask it but i have the answer for you about like when the change started to happen so like, with done... celebrities using the apps mm-hmm. right to where you could have a direct message to right this person that's typically completely out of touch you yeah it's so like that that blueprints always existed like we've been saying like obviously celebrity culture and all that is kind of it amped up since you know especially since like the, the times of paris hilton's up upcoming and then the kim kardashians and sure. all that but specifically with instagram um that really coincided with the hipster movement so okay. like 2000 in this like you, these dates kind of vary depending on where you fall in the subculture like obviously if you're in a city th- these dates are a little earlier if you're in a suburb they're a little Makes later sense. rural area a little later you know how that is yeah. but somewhere between 2008 2010-ish is when that movement started to kind of take off and a lot of it was actually engineered by marketers. I mean, it wasn't an all organic type of thing. You got to think like retail wise, like there's retailers who started pumping out new, just like you go to H&M or PacSun or wherever to buy your clothes. There's always new seasons of styles. Like retailers started pumping out these newer styles of clothing that were much more like like the lumberjack type looks for dudes and these sundresses for girls. And it became... I'm not complaining. Yeah, yeah, me me neither. (laughs) But it became like a whole um, retail movement. It became a marketing movement at the time. There was a lot of companies who were basically a lot of case studies were coming out where people were marketers were learning about what millennials wanted because like we at that time we would have been like in our teens like late teens early 20s right. somewhere in, around there in that figuring it out stage exactly it's like yep. what, what are the what does the millennial generation want and forget that they decided for us yeah, yeah. well they basically did i mean like, right. they they pulled <clears throat> some stuff that that came True, obviously. I mean, like, like wanting more transparency, wanting more, quote unquote, authenticness or authentic, authenticness, authenticity. New word. Um, yeah, right. And uh, so, obviously, like these were all buzzwords back then. And then, as platforms like Instagram grew, those that that whole marketing trend grew with it. So basically, words like authenticity became a marketing term over time because, like. They, that's what they thought millennials wanted. So as these things started to integrate, you saw like the style changes where people started dressing more dapper and that sure. whole like image, paying like, more attention to your outward appearance. Yeah, like and sort just, of in general. Yep, and, whether and, it be a lumberjack or exactly, it wasn't all like the nice, lumberjack looks. Obviously, yeah. but it was just that clean look where people were getting like guys were getting those haircuts where like they. would trim the sides all the way down and leave sure. hair on the top and beards and thick room glasses. And there were sure. all these trends that were kind of coming together. And Instagram was the platform where all that like converged basically because it's, it's aesthetically it's visual. So, and it can be seen from across the country into other countries. Exactly. Like, instead of like, Oh, the, the kid at the neighboring town's high school, I saw him at this, at this punk show, yep. and he had shorts on like this. I'm gonna do that. Yep. It, it's just like 
billion fold. I was gonna say tenfold, but you're yeah. you look at it on your phone now, yeah, exactly. and it's like that that kid that thought he was being original should not have tweeted that out because now <laughs> exactly everybody's doing it kind of thing. So, so like at that time where like you said people like us maybe 2010 2012 we I, I think I forget if Instagram came out in 2011 or 12 somewhere in there. Um, at that time period though, I mean we it was mostly just friends you followed and all that. But yeah. brands started to realize like this is the new upcoming platform. We'll start advertising more of these like aesthetically these these visual um, products like whether it was stuff like beard oil or like you know like like all natural gmo free shampoos or yep. just all like skin products like like the whole the whole visual like the 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 needs that marketers basically like extracted from millennials became like integrated into instagram more so than any other platform for that time period and then like obviously that trend is kind of simmered down I mean, it still exists stylistically and all that but right. the, the trend itself settled down like four or five years later now it's just another uh, among endless other trends that are happening at once but that was at a time where it was all very new like now there's probably i don't know what the number is i'm assuming it's close to a billion instagram users somewhere around there okay and it's like now yeah, I used, everybody's to, on used it, to hear so. where you know who's in the lead is there more people on facebook or is there exactly. more people on twitter or what's going on yeah so anyway this little like boring tidbit of, like that's kind of like how the the the, the um, journey i'm glad you have the answer and i'm I, I would expect you to i guess too so that's good yeah i mean it's, it's obvious like i said the accounts there's like slight variations in years depending on where you fall because right. if you worked in marketing obviously this stuff happened sooner because mm -hmm. you were seeing it sooner but for a lot of people like you who joined instagram and just kind of like a couple filing a couple friends and whatever for a long time you that's see like later. all it was yeah mm -hmm. i was like whoa i can like follow travis barker on here like yeah. that's cool <laughs> It's like, oh, good, I get to see what he had for lunch. Yep, yeah, once famous I needed, people... I needed that. <laughs> exactly. Like, once, yeah, once famous people got on it and influencers got on it, I mean, everything is just, like, it's just ramped up so quick as far as, like, the whole, the, the culture of getting sucked into the feed yeah. and everything, you know? I, I think there's a lot of different ways to use it, whether you're an individual or a business or you're trying to promote something or you just... or, or oh, even, yeah. even if that something is, like, being happy. Yeah. Or... Uh, you want to show people your dog like and all that like that's the stuff I like about it that it's like uplifting or just like it's your distraction while you're eating lunch to not think about what your boss is going to ask you to do in 10 minutes exactly. you get to like escape for a second but I would I, like, I, I would hate to think that people are taking that escape and looking at it and going oh God, my life sucks. Scroll. Yeah, I right. Oh, I wish I was there. This sucks. Mm -hmm. You know that just that mindset of like this is better than where I'm at right now. Yeah. Like, darn. You know? And even just the idea that the escape becomes the reality where then people get so sucked into that feed that it's it becomes more than just those bored moments or those in-between moments. And then it starts becoming, like, for, for me, I mean, it's my job, obviously, so it's a little different, but it's also had a, a side effects on me since I started working sure. at work. Now I just, I catch myself all the time grabbing my phone and looking at my phone at times when I don't need to be because I'm so used to doing that. Yep. It's like I always made fun of that for years for my friends. I'm like, oh, get off your phone. Like, I hate that my friends are on my phone, their phones when I'm trying to talk to them or whatever. And now I'm the I one. Agree. <laughs> do, yeah, and I, I do too. And I, now I'm the one doing that in a lot of cases because I think for a lot of people it be, just becomes so habitual that you're just you don't even think about it anymore it's like there's like you said for people who maybe are dealing with bad bosses or families or just situations that aren't ideal mm -hmm. and that escape becomes like their serenity and then yeah it's like you just want that space all the time yeah it, and it, it definitely like comforts your brain like you know it looking at all that stuff like mm -hmm. Makes makes it happy up in your head, oh, like yeah. you know. At least it's like a quick fix, you know. I mean, it it, it it's real, you know. Yeah. Are you a fan of Black Mirror? I don't know about it. Oh man, you gotta watch Black Mirror. We can't talk about it then. It's a television show. It's like a sci-fi show. show. Don't you know my retort to that? You, you should. I should have. You, you like Seinfeld? No, I was, <laughs> well, no. My my question is, if you say what is it called, you ask Black me. Black Mirror. You ask me what is Black Mirror. I would typically. I should have just said. Is it a movie or a TV show? Because if the answer is yes, then no, I haven't seen it. Yeah, no, <laughs> you, this is a show. It's it's one of the shows. I mean, it's a cultural phenomenon in the sense that okay. it's been out for maybe five, six years at this point. Maybe. On what well, platform? Um, at this point, it's on Netflix. I forget if it started on Netflix. I think it did start on Netflix. 
It's been out for a while though. Um, there are five seasons into it. Did Did you see online the the Bandersnatch? thing that everybody was talking about is like the new black mirror episode it's I, like a i know that name it's a uh it's what do you call it it's like a choose your own adventure type okay. thing it's netflix's first show doing that where they took it's just a stand. oh where you can like select like after mm-hmm. this scene do you want to go right or left exactly type of thing? yeah so yeah. they did that for the first time with the show and that was like a standalone episode where it has like five hours of options i mm-hmm. guess that you can pick but no it's just like a it's a sci-fi. It's, it's sort of like a modern take on um on the uh, the Twilight Zone okay. in the sense where it's just a lot of the uh, the focus is on smart technology and artificial intelligence and just stuff that it really it's kind of people's most dystopian fears about the future. You know, and it always has like a weird twist at the end where it just like bugs your brain out. Yeah, that type of thing. But it's really, really a well done show. And like that's over the years of just being on social media, certain. Parts of Black Mirror have not only just become more either reality or closer to reality, but you get that looming sense of just wow, like this is this is already like maybe it's not as dramatic as the TV show, but just with stuff like we're talking about, I mean, you can see the tangible effects that these phones and these devices have on our brains. Yeah. It's just it's weird, man. It, it does uh, it does affect you big time, yeah. w- whether you're realizing it or not. Yeah. So going going back to our. Uh our uh, relationship stuff um, and does all the TV watching and Mm -hmm. I'm just like uh, a uh, I'm collateral I guess (laughs) it's just like I'm watching this show if it's on on, I'm watching it too Uh, whether I'm like paying attention or not is is uh, is none of your business now (laughs) right um, but Every now and then I'm picking up on like, oh, you know, you should watch this, you should watch that. And typically that's the guy at work telling me, have you ever seen that movie? It was made mm-hmm. in 1972. It's a classic. <laughs> you have to watch it. And you're just like, uh. And I'm like, I'm never <laughs> going to even think about it again. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah. since the TV is, is always on, that's that's maybe one of the other things that like every now and then I'm just like, I just need like no TV today after work. Right. Um, but Anytime I want, it's like, hey, actually, can we change what you're watching and put this on? She's up for it. Mm. So God bless her. But um, <laughs> I, I will put that on my radar. Definitely, man. Black Mirror. You should. I'm, dude, I'd be, I'm like the opposite of you at this point. I used to be the person who didn't really watch TV and just okay. like when I was dating Rachel, like she was the big TV watcher and watched more TV shows than I ever knew existed. <laughs> and I would just kind of be along for the ride for her, too. But since I started working in social media, it's become like almost a necessary escapism like i need something to my for my brain to latch on to right you know and like and put I, your phone down yeah well i don't <laughs> even sometimes sometimes i do like it, it depends on the show like, i'm watching like game of thrones or something i'm really into then i'm i will but okay. for a lot of shows like, I'm, I'm working while i'm doing it so it's actually like it's it has both like the negative effect and the positive effect where it's negative too many devices on at once but positive it's helping me just to like calm down because a lot of the type of work i'm doing is like high like i'm getting adrenaline like just before yeah. we started podcasting i told you how someone tweeted it's probably blowing up right now that right, person right. tweeted this thing and like all these people were commenting on it and it was kind of critical of stakeum and i had to jump in and it was literally right before we started podcasting and my brain was just like bleeding <laughs> juice and energy and i was just like ah and like so when i'm like that at home, a TV show just like it's like a counterbalance where it helps just like keep me cool sometimes. But I got you. It can have the reverse effect too. But yeah, have you ever heard of Seinfeld? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's new. Do you Check still it out. listen to your Seinfeld podcast? They're finished. It's oh, it's done forever. One hundred. They went through every episode. One hundred and eighty episodes. Oh my god! I just said to Anne the other night, I was like, I miss Matt and Vinny. <laughs> That's incredible. I'm totally a, a, a man of routine, so. You are. What, <laughs> what are you listening to now? Are you listening to other podcasts? Um, No. You got to get one, man. I listen to. Start a new routine. You know what I listen to. It's the local radio show. Yep. So, like, I'm. I'm Preston I've, and Steve, shout out. Yeah, right. I, I didn't know if we were okay to say that. <laughs> um, but um, friends of mine are, like, constantly um, suggesting comedy podcasts mm. and and the names of the comedians are people i know because they come into philly and they go on the morning show and right, promote their right. events yeah, yeah. so like i'm i'm plugged into a lot of this stuff and and you had mentioned uh the that show where you can kind of pick your direction oh yeah bandersnatch sorry bandersnatch yeah. so 
Preston and Steve joked about that one morning about the name, and then they did discuss actually what yeah you know, what it was sort of about. So mm-hmm. it's it's local. Like I stay plugged into you know what's going on, what what the sports team did, who's in town this weekend, what comedians at the comedy club, and yeah. you know they do you know they'll, they'll probably talk about Firefest or they already did like before it came out like the weekend before or something. So like for me, it's not to be like entertained by like this like one guy who like hosts this thing every week but it's like a major like thing of my like region or whatever and i i used to listen to the like live radio show on like streaming during work when i could and then tim and the band showed me the podcast and there was mornings where i would be on my way to work and realize i forgot to download it i'd pull into like the starbucks parking lot and like steal their wi-fi for a second to mm-hmm. download the podcast yeah, yeah. so i could listen to it at, you know at work and i'd be you know you're like a day behind on cuz they were they're a live radio show right. so you hear it the, the following day but um i since I, i've been at my job in king of prussia now for almost 2 years and since starting there i definitely have less podcast time mm-hmm. to the point where i am like 2 days behind on the live radio show okay so um if i like once cycling kicks back up i'll run out of stuff and when i do go to seek out a new podcast it's like when i'm at home like folding laundry and i'm like i want to listen kill some listen time. to something yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but in, in the interim like it's like I don't even have enough time to keep up on my, you know, current events or whatever, yeah. whatever I am currently listening to. You're such a healthy adult. Like that is the goal. That is literally what I hope to get to at some point where I can, un- what? like, I can unplug to the point where what okay. you're following is okay. like your local. Like that's so. That's such an ideal way of looking at it. Like I shouldn't. I shouldn't say ideal. That's such a healthy way of looking at it because for someone like me, I am. I, you can ask Chelsea. And I follow way too many podcasts i mean actively each week i listen to at least seven or eight okay and usually and it's a, it's a range i mean to, like for everything of what duration uh, length of, of each i mean like each, are these like between, hour shows between 30 out 30 minutes and an hour okay to, on average some are longer depending on what they are like there's gotcha. some interviews that might be an hour and a half long but i might listen to say 30 minutes of it then finish the next sure the next week but i mean yeah my brain I don't know. I guess it just comes with a job. I mean, with working on social media, I feel like I need to constantly be connected to what's happening, like Mm -hmm. whether it's pop culture references or something that happened politically that I need to like be wary of what I'm posting, you know? Yeah. You gotta, you gotta know what happened this past weekend in, in the news, quote unquote, you know? Yeah. Just like staying on top of it. And like, I obviously I think being informed and all that is healthy in general for yeah. most people but there's definitely a, a point of diminishing return where, like, <laughs> where for you i mean that's like when you're following a local station you're getting your essentials like you don't yeah that's that's you know? sort of what what i really tap into with it but also they're putting out a daily show which is with you know boiled down without commercials and stuff is is a three-hour podcast mm-hmm. so like you said, you're listening to a 30 minute, maybe a 60 minute segment. Right. But if if they only had 60 minutes a day, I would definitely have other things that I needed to play because right. like I go back and forth like between music and podcasting. For me, it's mostly be like if I'm eating, I'm podcasting. If I'm driving and rocking out, I'm listening to music. Yeah. yeah. Um. So there's there's definitely the time for it and the time when I like really need it. So like if I had a long weekend where I was folding a lot of laundry and listened to the entire you know morning yeah, show podcast, yeah. I would need something. I used to like download like Bill Burr or and the Signcast one was something I like really made sure I listened to because it was like super relevant to me. Like I would even put like the morning show on the back burner for nice. for a night or two until I like listened to the other one. But yeah. But uh but yeah, what, other than um, other than what's really good, what do you what do you what do you <laughs> ha, what do you suggest? <laughs> for I mean, for you, do you like Bill Burr, the comedian? Um, yeah, I think he's uh, he's funny. I liked. I mean, you know how I am. Like, I know. If I, I know. get through two episodes and I like connect to it, I just want to hear it like that every time I listen to it. Right. Um, and he, you know, sort of had that um, at a time, and like friends of mine were listening to it at the same time, so we could kind of like chat about it. Yeah. Um, but there's not like. You know, he's not like you know my favorite comedian or whatever. Right? Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, I think stylistically, you'd probably really like uh, Pete Holmes's show. Have we talked about Pete Holmes before? No. 
He's uh currently. It's funny. Just last night, then this sounds like an ad, sounds like an ad. The new his new <laughs> show just premiered. The season three of it. It's called Crashing on HBO. Yeah, really he's funny part of show. That? What was that? I didn't know he was part of that. Oh yeah, do you know that? You know the show? I just the name and some people that have worked on it again, like Judd Apatow. Yeah, and uh, yes, he's like yeah, they've been friends and partners since the beginning. It's basically his life story. I didn't obviously. know that was it. What did, did didn't he have like a late night yep. show? He had the Pete Holmes show. That's so that's what I was. And he thinking had Bill on that show as well. Okay, so he's like he's so just my a, friend Sean has has is mostly the one referencing like yo check out this comedian's podcast mm, check out this one and right. and I usually saying like I don't listen to like the other show like for the comedians like it just so happens they're like part of it and that's actually probably how i've you know found out about bill burr's podcast or anybody like they had gilbert godfrey on the other day and like he still has a podcast this guy's 65 years old right right everybody's a podcast Uh, yeah (laughs) yeah basically which is i I was like psyched to come and chat with you and so far i'm in i'm enjoying it it's my pleasure (laughs) yeah it is crazy man everybody does have a podcast now especially comedians it's like their main medium for promoting shows like they all you kind of have to yeah you do even if you don't have one you have to go on them like they cross pollinate audiences between like for someone like uh like joe rogan's podcast was the first podcast i ever really got into that was like 2011 yep. and like when I think about back then the type of person I was and like the type of comedy I was into or like the stuff I was following there are these like almost like not echo chambers but just clicks of uh, how certain people are I mean Joe Rogan's gonna be friends with certain types of comedians and then there's some cross pollination mm-hmm. where like he's friends with someone like Bill Burr They'll do a bunch of shows together, but then Bill Burr is also friends with Pete Holmes. And, like, Pete Holmes and Joe Rogan, Pete Holmes went on Joe Rogan's show once. It was one of the worst episodes (laughs) they've ever done because it was a combination of things. Just, like, personality-wise, Pete Holmes is a really goofy comedian, very lighthearted. He makes a lot of puns. He's, like, really laughy, funny guy. Joe Rogan's a bit more offensive and edgy, and he's, like, when he gets into certain topics, he, he... He's almost like a non-comedian comedian. Yeah. Like, some comedians will make him howl laughing, but for a lot of other comedians, like, he just doesn't really laugh during shows, whereas Pete Holmes just laughs at literally everything. (laughs) So they had terrible chemistry, but, like, you see that, where, like, certain comedians, you know, they'll they'll be friends with other ones, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, I think Pete Holmes, for, like, your what your interests are, like, the kind of, he does a lot... He's a big range of comedians on his show, and, like, the topics he touches on are really, he does he does some pop culture stuff, he does some spiritual stuff, but it's all, like, really open and fun, and it's not, even when they talk about serious stuff, it's always, the undertones built in are very loose, and it's not, like, a, a heavy comedian-type podcast, right. even if it is, like, heavy content, like, he's some comedians have obviously had really rough lives like they get into their stories and all that yeah but, i like hearing about some of that stuff i mean yeah it's interesting yeah absolutely but it's a good tone like i think it's what it, i don't listen to it as much anymore but it used to be uh one of my favorite podcasts okay. so he's and really you, you know me pretty well in that regard to uh recommend such a thing yeah, i'm sure I'll, i'm I'll sure my friend you. sean has uh has recommended it before but he just says yo check this out yeah and then that's it that's, that's all it. i get <laughs> <laughs> so you've given me uh, yeah a qu- little pitch. quite a bit more to think about. Yeah, they're <laughs> yeah. All, everybody they're all different. Everybody clicks differently. Like there's some people that hate Pete Holmes' style because it's too goofy. And there's okay. some people that hate Joe Rogan's style because they think he's a douche. And, yeah. you know, like everybody has their kind of their niche of what they like and what they're after with with podcasts. But yeah, it's interesting, man. I'll definitely I'll throw you an episode. To suggest Th- there's to so some. much out there, so it's it's uh, like it's endless. It, it, I, I want to say it's hard to find, like, the right thing, but it, it shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, when you're inundated, it's like you don't know where to begin with yeah. half the stuff. I and mean, that's why I'm, half the people that listen to my podcast, I'm like, why do you listen to this? In my mind, like, not that it's bad, but in my mind, I'm thinking there's so much out there. Right. Like, what about... Why this one? Yeah, like, what about me or this? I mean, I try, I try to have interesting guests and try to have interesting conversations, but... Hope the, I'm just hope a, the next show's better. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Winky face, <laughs> but it's like I'm just some guy. Like you know what I mean. Like yeah. at the end of the day, like it's it's such a strange thing to ask of someone to commit their listening ear, just like you do with Preston and Steve sure. or whatever. It's it's a it's a cool thing that people will do that. You I know? mean, I've I've gotten uh, I've had the pleasure of of playing in bands with you and and hearing you sing and like I like your voice, so it kind of that and <laughs> and that's a big thing in Thanks, like hearing a new podcast like. Do you get comfortable with the host? Right. Because if, right. like, 
you connect to that or whatever, then like that becomes your like comfort thing. And and a lot of times if like I'm in a bad mood or something, I just like need to like listen to the Preston and Steve show for like a few yeah, minutes. Yeah, like your buddies. Yeah, they become and then your like friends. you hear them say yeah. a bunch of stuff that is probably irrelevant to your current situation, but then you just kind of you zone move out, move along. Yeah, like so, when I mean, you think it's... back on how many hundreds of Preston and Steve shows you listen to, oh, you don't remember. God. No, you, like you remember maybe bits and pieces of some. Yeah, but it's just nice listening. They, to They it. they play like best of segments when they're on vacations and stuff, and I'm like, I do not remember this, <laughs> and I've I've probably heard you know like every bit of every show for the last however many years that's insane. i mean that's the beauty of the podcast though you know it's like you you get the whole the whole show in in one nice shot yeah but i mean that's so it's it's funny to hear guests on their show talk about their podcast and like that's what i was saying earlier like they're actually before we even went on i was talking about like mic technique and stuff like that and mm-hmm. people are probably listening like well you don't know much about it do you <laughs> um but I hear them talk about that stuff and and that kind of stuff interests me in the same way that like I was talking about social media like I'm interested in like these people that are like making all this stuff happen not that like I'm like trying to be like the people that are posting this stuff but Mm -hmm. like I'm just interested in the way that this thing works and like how people do follow up with it and, and make it turn it into something like I'm interested in like how the production gets put together for a podcast and like sitting here and being in your studio like it's it's pretty neat seeing you know your setup and knowing you know who you've had on i listened to your um like your whole show and i you know i pieced together after the second one i listened to him like all right i think he like does the intro uh, you know at a different time and like so does, he, does he does he edit yeah like yeah. It, you know it's it's neat to like listen so it's, sometimes i'm listening for that kind of stuff too not just like okay are, are they interesting to hear right or are they talking about like good topics it's like all right is it like produced well or mm-hmm. like you know what is what's their mic technique like yeah, yeah just well, like Silly stuff like that's that. That's one of my favorite parts about podcasting long form like this, where did you just go for hours or whatever it is, right. is that you just you really get into the meat of who somebody is, you know? And like I think that's a big thing for me personally. And I hope that the people listening, I don't know for all of them, I, I a few of them have reached out. We've talked about this, but cool. it's neat when you get to talk at length like this because the parts of your personality and your character just inevitably seep through the microphone yeah. whereas like if you're just interviewing somebody in like a short 30 minute segment you're gonna get the sound bites and like you right can, you can make yourself sound cool or like that you know what you're talking about but when you get into subject matter like none of what we talked about tonight was prepared minus right. like you had the idea of talking about fire festival no or i had like two bullets that i yeah. wrote down today like i'm like i don't know doesn't is nathan gonna have like questions for me <laughs> And I didn't. I was just what like, doesn't he know? No. We, we hung out so many times. It's just you just talk and like that. That part of it to me. I mean, obviously, it's great doing interviews, and I love probably most of what I do in this podcast is strictly interview based. But even with those interviews, I do my best to just re- like get the guest comfortable because yeah. I, I want people to feel like we're just having a conversation. Like I'm not gonna do any gotcha moments where like people <laughs> are like you know I'm, I'm cornering them with some opinion and making them do say something polarizing or whatever, but yeah. and I do hopefully as this goes on, I can get more comfortable challenging people and, and getting more c- comfortable in my own skin, I guess. But I mean, overall it's just the, the, it's the coolest thing to me is just being able to be myself and talk to people like you who know me or people that don't know me and get to know them in these through, pl- through the podcast or yeah. through the interview, which is, which is pretty yeah. interesting in whatever, even an hour, of chatting with somebody over, I mean, you said you do some on Skype or, you know, in fr- at the microphones right. here, but um, that is a pretty cool thing to just, like, get to know somebody that way. And and once you do, like, loosen up, basically, you do feel like, obviously, by the end of, you know, some of the shows, you're like, all right, he really, like, cracked into that guy or whatever. Or they, yeah, right. Or this person really finally, like, you know, said the stuff we were really, you know, I guess hoping to hear, <laughs> but yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's an it's a definitely a, an interesting platform, and um, like I said, I'm I'm pretty thankful we've been talking about doing this for a little while, and I I know you you wanted to get on this was like last year at some point, probably I stopped recording them oh, okay. altogether, so I'm really glad we got to because I guess we were talking earlier, I I uh, like front loaded before my wedding right in August, so I did like seven great planning, yeah right, right. <laughs> and then just never wanted to edit them because that's that's the best and worst thing about 
doing this to me personally, it's I have to edit all of them. And I don't I never edit things out people say, unless it's like maybe they go on a little tangent and then switch topics and it didn't really go anywhere. Like that you know what right. I mean? Like maybe they didn't mean to say that type of thing, but I'll edit to to make people sound good, to cut out some likes or ums or sure. whatever and or some echoes. And uh just going through the whole podcast is the most time consuming thing. And when I do that Obviously, I'm listening to how I sound more than the other person sounds because super analytical. Yeah, right? like for you, I'm just like, oh, Kyle sounds great, but I'm listening to every little like and um right. and space and awkward breathing <laughs> that I do. Like you get all these little ticks along yeah. the way, and that annoys the shit out of me. And I'm like, why would anyone listen to me talk? But I think everybody, t- to your point, you become more self-critical as you do that kind of stuff because most people listening don't care yeah. ultimately <laughs> well and as a listener like i'm yeah, like i was curious like you know what what the studio looked like or how like you were saying you were just saying oh i do edit or mm-hmm. I, you know, this is how this is how i put it all together and yeah and that kind of stuff is interesting to me and hopefully the people listening i'm sure people that most people that listen to podcasts have to have a little bit of like yeah like um not like production interest but just like curiosity right right yeah, on yeah. like you know what like because it's, it's a personal thing it's like what's yeah. this guy up to like all right how does he put his little show together or whatever it's, right it's uh that that's a fun part of it for me so yeah it is super interesting <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot out there yeah it's cool man yeah this is like the fun conversation yeah it's uh we did uh i i unfortunately had to cancel our last uh date which uh, is, I don't know, probably the second time I've done that in my life. No, I'm kidding. Um, Knowing you, I wouldn't be surprised. No, I know. I was playing into that. <laughs> um, uh, but we uh, we do have plans to hang out this weekend. But I had said when we made the date to do this uh, ahead of uh, our double date that I was like, this will be cool to like catch up and chat about some things just right. on the mic. Like It'll be pretty organic, I, I hope. And we so. can get all of our nonsense out of the way. That's so another thing I was thinking. Wives, yeah. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> we're we're more present uh, with them. Yes. Absolutely, yeah, man. Anything else you wanted to add toward the end, or I don't think so. Yeah, I feel good. Yeah, it was a fun time. I had a nice nice conversation, and I I said before I you know a year ago when we talked about doing this, like I did want to talk about the you know the bonuses and the benefits of playing in bands, and mm-hmm. um, that was really the only thing I definitely wanted to you know. Share a little bit about. Yeah, we've had, and it's it was fun because we've had a lot of a similar experiences yeah. in that realm. Yeah. So it's cool bouncing that stuff off. Like All it's, positive stuff. It's sealed in in the record book now. Yeah. So our, our future children or whoever yep. can can now listen to this and be like, "Yeah, oh, you were an idiot." Or... I, I still have a sealed uh, <laughs> version of. Uh, oh boy, I shouldn't be forgetting the name of the. N.E.R.J. album. Oh, my God. I forget. Um, okay. I don't feel so bad. Shoot. But uh, w- repose? Thank you. <laughs> I still have a sealed... It took me a second, too. You're okay. A sealed package of that. Um, that's great. For my uh, my future family. Too. Oh, that's so cool, man. Like, hey, I did something at one point with, yeah. with a drum Before set. Before I was old and boring. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> I swear I was cool, at, just like you want to be. <laughs> about that all the time. Cool. Like, man, by the time my kids are, like, old enough to be doing their own thing, they're going to think I'm so lame and bored. I'm like, I hope I have something to yeah. show them at that point. That's but my gold record to hang on the wall. That's awesome, yeah. man. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again for doing this. And Thanks for having me on. Peace out, everybody. See ya.